All right, Delora, we are back. Ashley. Oh my gosh, I'm Hello, so happy my to friend. Be, be here with you. Absolutely. This is episode four, recapping with Delora and Ashley. So sorry, guys. We had to take a little break last week. You know, life happens, things happen. We do want to hopefully get a chance to chat every week. Um, and we just hope that through almost three hour show kind of helps y'all <laughs> over for the week that we were not here, but we so appreciate it. We've gotten some great feedback. We appreciate all the listenership. Yes. Thank you so much. It's been amazing. So it, we, we started talking about before we hit record our, our drinks of choice this evening. So I'm over here sipping my usual, some Crown and Coke, which I am, I'm drinking Crown <laughs> Vanilla though, just because they was out of Apple at the liquor store. I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> what are you sipping on, Delora? So I'm sipping on uh, my boo, The Rock, his new tequila. So it's so funny that you you drink Crown. I'm a clear person through and through, mm -hmm. with the exception mm -hmm. of like red red wine. But when it comes to liqueur, it has to be clear for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like my mom, my mom is all about that vodka. I think for me, I started with tequila mm -hmm. as my drink of choice. And that tequila, I don't know if anybody gets like me, but I cannot drink tequila and stay calm. Like tequila is one of those <laughs> liquors that have me bouncing off the wall. So I'm like, I, I got introduced to whiskey. It's very nice, very smooth for me. Mm -hmm. And it's just my drink of choice, you know, if I'm going to be at home chilling, stuff like that. But mm -hmm. appreciate you showing your boy The Rock so much love. If y'all don't remember, Delora has been giving him love almost every episode. <laughs> Dwayne, Dwayne, you better start listening. Exactly. But it's really good. Uh, we actually got this recipe out of uh, a men's uh, health magazine. I can't remember which edition. It's not the one with uh, Lenny Kravitz. Uh, it's the oh. one with Yaya. And, um, Lenny and them it, abs. Lord Jesus. Uh, speaking of aging like fine wine. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> If y'all think we're objectifying men, it's just appreciation. Because I asked one of my friends, was like, "You need y'all always talking about some men. Well, it's appreciation. Be happy that we love you guys, okay? I'm not blind. That's all I have to say to that. Listen, it is love and appreciation. That's beauty. That's beauty. It's a work of art, and we just appreciate works of art around here. <laughs> all right, so how, how's your week been going, though? How are things? Things are going. Just trying to pace myself. Big, big week next week. Uh, so, yeah. How about you? Same. I mean, as you know, I had to take a little impromptu trip and uh, that travel experience still has me over here temperature checking and <laughs> making sure that yes. hopefully I'm, I'm, I'm doing just fine, you know, sipping on a few things, taking my vitamins. So, you know, y'all pray for me out there. Uh, but, you know, otherwise, like you mentioned, next week is the election. And I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to remain optimistic that all hell's not going to break loose. Because I think if I start worrying about it now, I'm just going to be stressed out over the weekend. And I, I, it's out of our control. There's nothing I can I do. agree. It's too, it's too heavy to be stressed out this early. Early. I think all my yeah. stress has happened um, months before this point. This yeah. is like, it is what it is. I did everything I could do. And Absolutely. so let's just see what happens. Girl, pray for us. Pray for us all, okay? Um, exactly. So <laughs> let's move into our hot topics of, hot topic. of this week before we get into uh, our recap, which is going to be Delora. What are we recapping this week? Bad hair a Hulu original um by justin simeon the creator of dear white people and we will still hit you guys with some hidden gems as well but um you know laura want to do something a little spooky in celebration of halloween so happy halloween happy halloween it's this week Yes, yes. And it's on a Saturday and it's daylight savings time ending. So if you out party, you get that extra hour. But anyway, <laughs> are we partying? Are we really partying I, right now? <laughs> um, in the city that I live in, they have they're going to allow people to drink out in the open downtown to allow for more social distancing. So yes, I would say people are definitely planning Whoa. to get out and party, baby. So 
I'll just say that. But again, enjoy yourself, whatever adventure you make. If you just get, if you just want to put on a costume, sit around your house, I'm not judging you. Okay. It's been a year. Do your thing. Do your thing. Uh, so let's get into these hot topics of the week. Our first one up that, you know, we, we chatted about a little bit is Shonda Rhimes. Uh, Shonda yes. obviously is such a creative force. Um, has been for the last few years. Um, people boss. know her from everything from Scandal to How to Get Away with Murder um, to Grey's Anatomy that is Private still practice. on the air. Yes. Absolutely. So, you know, she's really been a force, a creative force, and she made the decision to leave her home that she was at of ABC and go to Netflix, which at the mm. time was a huge get for Netflix, right? And the Major. content creation game, it was like, oh, Oh, okay. She was actually the first because she was. after she her was. then was Tyler left own um, Ryan Murphy left yep. Fox. So yep. she was a leader in this. And Ryan um, Murphy has been churning some stuff out too. Exactly. I've actually been like, where's Shondaland stuff? <laughs> so I'm going to mention that at the end because I definitely want to recap her first show. She's going to be on Debbie Allen. I think that's going <gasps> to yes. be a great one for us to that's do. Right. It, come, it drops November 27th. Well, I guess I'm pivoting now. She's going to do her first one. It's going to be on Debbie Allen. It drops November 27th on Netflix. Who's also a boss and a legend. Girl, I don't think I fully appreciated Debbie until more recently when I saw, remember that one documentary I told you about on Netflix where it was yes. highlighting Black creatives? So again, yes. the fact that she really pushed and was the producer and got Amistad made and just some of those things I was very unfamiliar with in her career. I'm like, Debbie. Had no idea. Girl, you've been doing your thing, listen. For so, years. <laughs> absolutely. So the thing with Shonda is, again, she decided to leave ABC and this was after 15 years of being with this network. So a whole article, lot of cash, girl. And just the the article that we're going to discuss is that she's, you know, at the time it was like, okay, you know, you think she's doing it because it seems like a good career prospect because obviously Netflix is what it is today, this juggernaut. But yes. she explains why, quote unquote, in this interview um, that she had with the Hollywood Reporter, which is basically. She had been in an ongoing battle with ABC over multi-year deals and compensation years before she left, but it wasn't until she attempted to receive an additional all-inclusive Disneyland pass for her sister, which was a perk allotted to her through her deal with ABC at the time, per this article, that she decided to leave the network. After allegedly being told, don't you have enough? by a high-ranking official, Rhymes <sighs> immediately called her lawyer and implored that they negotiate a deal with Netflix. Since then, she signed a nine-figure deal with the streaming service. And as you mentioned, other producers and creatives have followed along in her footsteps. Again, she has not yet dropped her first release. Her first release is gonna be the documentary about Debbie Allen, but it was a it was a really a big huge deal at the moment and the fact that Major. she's saying hey this was the catalyst for it. what were your thoughts about this article and did you think did you think this was slightly a, a very small thing that she decides to leave on or do you think it was more so like all these other things happened and this was just the straw that broke the camel's back what were your thoughts so when i first understood why she left i actually saw someone's tweet and you know they distilled it in the most um simplest way of like oh she loved disney over some disney ticket over a disney ticket and then i was like what and so i actually took the time to dig into this article and after reading it i was like absolutely absolutely first of all she has the ability to monetize the type of value that she has brought to that network. Yeah. But for someone to have the audacity to say that to you, I, I think it's almost like being in a relationship and someone not knowing your value until you pick up your things and you go yeah. and you have a new person on your arm and the old person's looking really stupid. So <laughs> I, I I can't get over, you know, so the person who wrote that tweet was trying to um, belittle Shonda's decision to leave. Mm -hmm. But for me, it's like the audacity of this exec to say this over the phone. Don't you have enough? Yeah. Don't you? 
I am still making you millions of dollars okay. on an annual basis. Okay. And you can't give me a, 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 let's just be generous and say a $200 ticket. To Disneyland. That it's you not owned. even. It's not even Disney World. It's <laughs> Disneyland. They don't even have a square, same square footage. Okay, I've been to both. Um, okay. So I, I think she was very much in her right to leave because guess what? She signed a reported three hundred million dollar deal with Netflix. She was and not going to level. get. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I don't want to interrupt. And, and we don't even know. If that's a real number or not, like sometimes the number in media is either an exaggeration or lo- lo- lower, frankly. So I know she got her coin and she deserves it. Even, even if all of her future stuff is crap and I'm not wishing that on her, but <laughs> what all. she has done in the industry thus far, she deserved every dime that she got. And Disney should feel like they have egg on their face right now. Mm. And I'm sure somebody did. I, I don't, I'm sure Bob was not super excited about that loss. To your point, um, Shonda's legacy is solidified, right? So I think, you know, at this point, what, another thing that I had read about her was, you know, she was feeling very creatively stifled. She was not yes. happy. So to say that it just boils down to one ticket again, that's the reason why I asked you, do you think this is just the straw? Because there's sometimes you have a lot of large issues that go on with something and it takes one thing, one day to be like, yeah. listen, this is it. Like, she I'm was done. feeling petty that day, but I, you know, I'm a cancer, so we live in petty. <laughs> I cannot with you. I cannot with you. <laughs> I could I'm not with you. It, girl. <laughs> Again, I just think, I think no matter what she's saying in terms of this being the final straw, there was definitely a lot of hurdles that she went through before she got to this point. Um, again, I think sh- the creative flexibility that she is going to have at Netflix, which is mentioned Can in this article. Can you imagine? There's it's just no probably boundaries. Gonna be, exactly. No boundaries. And she also compared- said, she said that she is excited to work somewhere where no one's going to bother her because she's so used to having such oversight yes. at a network of them trying to control probably and tell her. And I mean, there are, there are reasons for that, but at the same time, you know, that is one of the luxuries in Netflix. That's one of the things that makes them a giant competitor in the industry that they're Absolutely. in because they do not have FCC regulations. They don't have a lot of other things that, you know, you have to monitor for when it comes to content creation. And the fact that your audience is global, the fact that you can release something and it is seen by millions upon millions of people in it like within a week I mean that exactly. is that that's is power rich, and that's control that you, unfortunately it's just hard to compete with so you know again Honestly, I, I, I was thought it was say, a coup what'd you say I thought it was a coup at the time I was like oh god okay this yeah. is where we at because it was yeah. like during that time as you mentioned it was like first it was Shonda and then there were multiple kind of like deals across the board after that. I was like, oh, it's about to be a war for creatives out here. Exactly. And guess what? We live in a co- capitalist society. That is what it's the foundation of how our economy works. High is bitter. Who's going to pay for it? I just And I'm, who's going to be actually... able to give them what they want. And unfortunately, ABC can no longer deliver what she wanted. So... Yeah. And honestly, when I heard the announcement, because at this point, it's been about two years at, uh, since the initial yeah. announcement. Yeah, I was really concerned about my shows, How to Get Away with Murder and Grey's Anatomy, because I still watch. And so when they ended How to Get, Get Away with Murder, I just was getting a little nervous about Grey's. And I don't know if you saw this, but Alan Pompeo, frankly, just said, um, you know, this could very well be our last year. So I hope oh, I that ABC that. doesn't you know, jump off uh, the deep end and, and cancel Grey's Anatomy after this year. I think Grey's at least has two more years under his belt. I think, has it reached the most seasons for a drama? I think it's I reached think it surpassed already. ER. I think it surpassed yeah. ER, which I think held that record. Don't hold us to that, guys. You can feel free yeah. to Google it. But that sounds about right. But to your, I mean. And it's a cash so, cow, so they'd be stupid. In the, in so the world I definitely, of, of Corona, in, in, the, in the world of Corona, they would be silly to cancel Grey's Anatomy right now because there aren't any new shows that are worth replacing it at this time. They can barely make Station 19 work. And <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that it would, def- I don't think that it would be a network decision and at this point with ratings and everything still being what they are to proactively 
attempt to cancel Shonda shows. I think it was a blessing that they were able to continue to have that those properties after she left. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Like this yes. is not she still had and still does have fandom that attracts viewers to ABC. So I don't think that it would come down to Disney being like, well, you know, F you, Shonda, we're going to cancel your shows. That <laughs> that wouldn't make sense. Your money is still making me money. So let's go ahead and rock with this so we can't rock no more. And how to get away with murder. I mean, I don't know how much you watch it there at the end, but I was kind of over it. So I didn't mind the how to get away with murder went away. You know, love. Yeah, same. Love I you, Viola. Viola. Shade Viola is the whatsoever. only person who love can't you, girl. me. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I just wanted to make sure she got, she got paid. <laughs> Kept <getting> Absolutely. Paid. <laughs> All right, but I'm let's glad move. that they were able to end it without, you know, canceling it, you know? Yes. Let's move on to our next one. We, we both have talked about that for the sake of time, guys. We know we read a lot last time. We're going yes, yes, yes. to try to stay within a window. So we're going to work on that. But again, still, still be able to give you guys some great content. So the next hot topic, Jada Pinkett Smith, Miss Jada. She is still going strong with Red Table Talk, with Willow and her mama, who is still out here aging like a fine wine and on every Black woman's list of who they want to look like. I As know, we age and get 60s. older, she looks amazing. amazing. So not as they do not all look amazing. I need their workout regimens ASAP. But um, <laughs> so on the on one of the latest episodes, uh, Jada Pinkett, it was brought up that Jada Pinkett essentially was harder on Willow growing up in terms of discipline than she was on Jaden. As everybody knows, Willow and Jada have two kids between them. There's Trey, who's also a stepson, but between them is Willow and Jaden. And I guess basically Willow talked about one particular case and point she made was when they would be getting ready to go to school. Um, she, Jada would be really hard on her, critical on her about getting ready, not being late. But when it came to Jaden, she'd softly ask if he was ready. So Jada's response essentially <laughs> was that she was tougher on Willow. She admits to being tougher on Willow because she feels that Black women have to work harder. Her quote is, I needed you to be strong because I know what this world is like for us as Black women. So one of the reasons why, obviously, this is a hot topic that you and I you know, wanted to talk about was because we are Black women. So d did you ever feel, first of all, what were your thoughts on this article? And did you ever feel like there would be justification of a parent being harder on one child or another based on their um, gender because of the harsh realities that we face as Black people in America? Excellent that feels question. like a loaded, I must say it felt yes. loaded, but you know yes. <laughs> break, break that down however you want to break that down. excellent question ashley well i actually watched the whole red table talk it was an excellent episode okay. um i do not feel like parents should treat their kids different based off gender mm. um in terms of mothers being tougher on daughters i actually am interested in your answer because i grew up uh with it was just me and my sister so uh it's just the girls right yeah so whether or not she was tougher on us it wasn't very clear if anything her discipline was based off of the the child kind you know what i mean like who got in trouble who didn't or what what have you so um, I mean, I still would be curious, though, of just your thoughts. And I mean, you said that you don't think people should discriminate, but did you understand where Jada was coming from? Do you feel like, oh, I guess, you know, that makes sense in terms of her thought, her logic behind it? I mean, I empathize with her logic, but I can't say I agree with it just because how do you end these cycles in society? It starts at home. So mm. as far as I'm concerned, if um, I ever have that dynamic in my household I mm -hmm. I really am looking forward to being consistent on all fronts if anything adjusting it based off the child's personality but based off gender no no I mean yeah. speaking of me growing up in a household with two girls I mean I mowed the line. I clean. You know what I mean? Like I took out the yeah. trash. Like there were no like gender roles in that sense um, growing up. You know. Although yeah. yeah, did my dad do most of the stuff? Absolutely. But we were introduced to almost everything. Okay. Yeah. So my perspective, again, to your point, I did grow up with myself and an older brother in the house. So 
when I read this, I was thinking, you know, in my own experience that I ever have where I felt like my mom treated me any differently. I can say growing up when my dad was still in my household, there was a difference um, mm -hmm. just on, you know, him being actually harder on my brother than he was on me. But my mm -hmm. mom was kind of the parent that was always pretty even. And still to this mm -hmm. day, I feel like tries to be pretty even and fair between the two of us because, you know, we're not really much of a difference in age, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I think I mentioned this to you before, too. Like, I think my mom raised me in such a way where, you know, she didn't necessarily, she never, she never made our gender a part of or a rationale for anything that she introduced us to, didn't introduce us to, mm -hmm. um, even to the point of I told you, like, my looks were never something I was, um, you know, talked about or, mm -hmm. you know, really discussed or put emphasis on. It was more so about, you know, both of our accolades, like, in school and education and accomplishments and stuff like that. So, you know, I agree with you. I, I don't think that it should be gender-based. And if you would make it gender based, I guess I would really have to understand, have a better understanding of what Jada's experiences were that she thinks mm -hmm. that she had to be harder on a daughter than a son. Because black men, as we know and we've seen in America, have a very, very, very hard time. So, yes. Well, so do so. So does black women. And no, absolutely. Tie, tie absolutely. But into, I'm just saying, like, but, but, but what I'm trying to say is it ties into the conversation we're going to have later about our hair, black women's hair. We're constantly judged and we're constantly mm -hmm. told that, you know, just being who we are is not enough. It's not good enough. Something's wrong with it. You have to change it. And right. so I understand I, like I said, when I, when I saw the interview, or I should say the show, um, I empathize with what she had to say be, um, because they were talking from a very um, global perspective when it comes to like women, women in society, you know, okay. we're still, we're still fighting for rights over our bodies so and i was gonna say the general topic on us. the so, general topic of the show was about women being mean to other women right wasn't yes. that the base okay yeah yes i didn't watch it but i read that mm -hmm. that was a general basis and i just wanted to bring that context just because again i i don't think so and you know the whole conversation of nature versus nurture again it starts mm -hmm. at home with how parents interact with their kids and you know willow seeing that she could have and she might have, she didn't really go into much detail. She could have easily developed resentment towards her brother, you know? Or and her so, mother, right? Like, exactly. Why yes. are you, why do you treat me like this? And again, the idea of tough love, I don't know, that's, that's also kind of generational to me. Um, Very much because, because uh, depending on what tough is, yes. <laughs> like, that's not necessarily the way that everybody responds to, you know, molding them in the way you necessarily want to mold them. But again, and it, that's it, the privilege of us living in the time we live in, too, is yeah. we have, you know, the opportunity to look back with 2020 vision. <laughs> mm. And I see what um, you did there. Yeah, and, you know, really evaluate um, how things were so we can be able to move forward with mm -hmm. a cleaner slate. Yeah, that's a good point, though, Delora, in terms of the overall context and the fact that we as women, I mean, obviously there's sexism and we get a lot of judgment based mm -hmm. on, you know, our bodies. So great point there. We have two more hot topics that we'll kind of yes. roll through. Um, the, the second to last one being Girl Borat 2 and this controversy I'm sure you guys have heard about with Sasha Baron Cohen um, basically having a scene in the film where Rudy Giuliani um, is caught in a very compromising situation. So essentially, he is being interviewed by a faux journalist who is supposed to be Borat's daughter in the film. She's only supposed to be 15. And um, Rudy, Giuliani, Rudy Giuliani gets interviewed. Um, thereafter, she escorts him into the bedroom of a hotel room they're in. They're drinking. Uh, they're supposedly taking off mics. He leans back, on, lays back on the bed, and is supposedly reaching for the microphone and tucking back in his shirt, allegedly. Whereas it kind of like he could have been fondling himself, or you know, it just looks compromising <sighs> and quite inappropriate. 
Fight. And Laura, I know you said you haven't seen the movie yet. Did you say you saw the clip though? Did you watch the clip? Oh yes, I've seen the clip. I've seen news coverage over it and everything. So I know what? exactly what you're talking about. What were your thoughts on this? What a creepy old man. And <laughs> and honestly, it probably needs a little bit more coverage than what it's getting because this young woman was 15 years old. We are in the age of me too, okay? Uh, this is not okay for a man of his stature and age, but completely grossed out, completely. Mm. I, I didn't watch it, but I'm pretty sure I would have been disgusted and enraged, but <laughs> I can't believe he still has a job, but that's, that's going that's that would go down a rabbit hole that we're not going to go into today. yeah i was gonna say he's taken a, a sharp <laughs> turn over over quite a while with his um obviously his dealings with uh trump and and being a part of that um uh administration and all of that but um to your point i guess if nothing else in my opinion it was very very poor judgment on his part right i don't care who this one young lady actually ended up being. I don't care what the circumstances are. Why would you start drinking, go into a bedroom? I watched the movie. He was like, or watch when you watch the scene, rather, he's like touching on her shoulder, asking for her number and address. And it's just the, the two room. of them in this hotel it, room, right? Exactly. It's like, Ugh. even if you, even if you have not in your mind blatantly done anything, the innuendo was there that we as viewers can think, well, if the cameras weren't here and this was not, um, a, a movie, what else would have happened and what else has happened? You know, there have been so many politicians who've been caught in scandalous situations. Yes. <laughs> not to throw Andrew Gillum under the bus, but Andrew Gillum oh the last one. I was going to protect him. Girl, I'm not, listen, protect I just, him. it's not to throw him under the bus. He has now gone on, as you said, Tamara Hall, he went on there and talked about it. Listen, that's not, I think Andrew Gillum still seems like he's an excellent individual. What he I'm has saying a podcast is, and everything. Yes, what I'm saying is, is these scandals happen. So to think about what may be happening, you know, when the cameras are not there, like, sir, if nothing else, you you had very poor judgment that day. You put yourself in a compromising situation. And you should not be shocked at all that this it's is news. not okay. It's simply not okay, that's and right. that's just putting it mildly. Yeah. So our last hot topic. We have not touched, I don't think, on the Kardashians thus far. But unfortunately, this week, they cannot be escaped because Miss Kimberly Kardashian decided for her 40th, 40th big milestone birthday bash to take select family and friends to a private island and post about it all over social media. The backlash has been swift and decisive basically saying that the privilege that kim kardashian has is obviously eluded her in this moment there are people who are going through unemployment homelessness death of loved ones during this pandemic and you ma'am have the audacity to post something like this and think that we're gonna be like oh how nice how cool that you got to go to your private island because you are a multi-millionaire with your family um supposedly under the strictest conditions even though as we saw there were employees who were on the island with wearing you. masks yes. um and and, and it, i think it just screamed tone deaf to most people who saw this and 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 commented on it so what are your oh and a caveat you sent today obviously was that chloe was on ellen chloe kardashian yes. her sister and basically said oh you know i don't want this to overshadow the wonderful time that kim had the wonderful time we had um you know we get it we were able to help the people who were there basically feed their families with our visit because we were giving them money you know some levels of justification but there was no stretch but okay. there was no acknowledgement of why people really felt the way they felt that's what i took from from chloe's ellen interview but give well, me your thoughts you, you first missed the headline the she told her sister she told her sister to ignore the haters so right she did say that. sorry i didn't pull up the chloe no part, it's okay so i'm glad you added that on there yes she called <laughs> 
people who would say anything called them haters but chloe always likes to call people haters so she does not surprising i guess that she continues to use that refrain in some of the decisions that they make in their lives anyway what are your thoughts before we end our hot topic session um read the room kim honestly i'm gonna bring it back to ellen so this is like on the same line when um when Ellen was complaining about being in quarantine and she's in her multi-million dollar house in Beverly Hills or wherever in California. It's like, we don't want to hear celebrities complaining. And we also don't want to see celebrities flaunting their wealth. Um, you know, honestly, I should say, I shouldn't say we, cause me personally, I I don't care. Like, I don't like to count people's money and I don't like to tell people how to spend their money. But what I will say is because she is a public figure and because there is so much hurting going on in our country, Mm -hmm. it just seems like it was, you know, obviously it would have been cute, you know, two years ago, three years ago to do this because we we expect the Kardashians to have lavish parties. But in a time especially with her birthday being so close to the holidays and so many people unable Mm -hmm. to spend it with their family and friends and again um covid cases are rising the death toll is rising unemployment is increasing you know like this is there's a lot of stuff going on we don't really care kim and 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 uh, one more caveat one could also say oh, well, you know, celebrities have always been a form of escapism, right? No, I don't think a lot of people wanted to see it, frankly. Right, right, right. I agree with you wholeheartedly. Again, when I first saw it, I just was like, I mean, it's very in the vein of of them. So it didn't, it didn't rub me the wrong way to comment on it initially. But I think, you know, when I think about 2020, when I think about the hardships, you know, Kim, I understand if you wanted to, you know, enjoy your 40th birthday, but again, being a public figure, the same way we talked about Jeannie last week, there are consequences and repercussions to that. And one of them is criticism. So if you're going to assume or decide that it's okay in the midst of a global pandemic, in the midst of this hella important election, that you want to post 40th birthday photos from a private island, then be prepared for the wrath that that's going to incur. So you know what I mean? Like, I don't, I don't understand anymore. If I were the Kardashians, if you had the audacity, I guess is a good word to say to do it, then just own it. Like, don't, I wouldn't even, I probably wouldn't even comment anymore because obviously you made the decision. You did what you did. You decided to post it and let the chips fall where they may. Next time, if you don't want the backlash, don't, post photos take your ass to your private island take your little pictures on your cell phones hold them dear to your heart as memories and keep it moving she needs to take a she needs to take a chapter out of beyonce's uh media book post that mess a year after it happens okay and then people can get excited for you right because right now it's just not it but you know let's keep it real right they how long are they going to remain relevant in this way right their show is about to end not to say they're not going to be in the public eye but their power is going to be dwindling very soon so this is a milestone she wanted to um she wanted to share it just the way her sister shared it because you know when courtney turned 40 it was a major to do Mm -hmm. she wanted to outdo her sister as always and uh (laughs) you know but to what extent right to to the extent of her getting this type of backlash exactly again when you're a public figure be prepared for the wrath of the people at all times anyway the lord that's the end of hot topics for today please feel free to lead us in our recap of bad hair yes so this week's recap is bad hair it's a hulu original uh rating tv ma uh came out this this year just last week it's an hour and 40 43 minutes and it's a horror film in particular they uh like to consider it to be a a horror a satire a satire horror film (laughs) excuse me so here's a quick summary 
in 1989, an ambitious young woman gets a weave in order to succeed in the image obsessed world of the music of music television. However, her flourishing career may come at a great cost when she realizes that her new hair may have a mind of its own. Mm-hmm. It's starring newcomer L. Lorraine. Um, I tried to look her up. Uh, she had the most prominent role before this one um, was in Insecure. And oh, I didn't even remember her from Insecure. Who did she play? Yeah, I think she was Issa's assistant. Um, okay. Okay. For the the party, the block party. Oh, I think that was her. Oh, really? Okay. I think okay. So. Okay. okay. Um so we have Vanessa Williams Legend as yes. Zora. Oh, the lead character name is Anna. Um we have Le- uh Lena Hathaway, <laughs> Lena Waithe, forgive me, <laughs> Emmy Award winning writer, producer. She's Brooke Lynn in the film. Um, we have the young lady, Sister, uh, Sister Soul, and her name is uh, Yamin King. Um, Yanni, that's Yanni, Yanni King, remember from Sneakerheads. Yeah, She was the wife in Sneakerheads. Thank you, thank you, mm-hmm. Ashley, that's right. Yep. Um, Kelly Rowland. Legend Girl. Girl. as Sandra. We have Lorraine Cox, legendary as um, Ver- Virgie. I believe yep. that's how you pronounce her yep. name. Um, Blair Underwood, legend as A- Amos. I was, I was not mad about that gray hair. <laughs> never, never. Usher, legend as Jermaine. And Get it we us. have James Vanderbeek, legend. <laughs> Dawson Leary. <laughs> Dawson Leary is in this. And honestly, there were many more uh legends, frankly, in the film, but these are the um the the top of the bill. And as I, I have, go ahead. I had just one more listed, which was Jay Farrow as Julius, because Julius was a, a pivotal character. Yes, thank you yep. so much. I actually mm-hmm. had his name here. I completely forgot him. Thank you, Ashley. Of course. And again, Justin Simeon, uh, who is the writer and director of Dear White People, both both the film and the Netflix original show by the same name. And so a little bit of background. This is Justin's second screenplay. On Rotten Tomatoes, <laughs> critics gave it a 64%. So that's still popcorn worthy. But for the audience, it was a 49%. Ooh. And that's for your everyday watcher. Yikes. Overall, this film has gotten mixed reviews on social media, mainly trending downward. <laughs> uh, okay. So, okay. Um, Ashley, before I give my grade, what's your grade? Oh, man. Oh, man. See, now you saying that it's been getting bad reviews makes me want to give it a better one just because I root for underdogs in life. Goodness. But I cannot fake the funk for our listeners. No. So I have watched this as usual twice for the sake of the podcast. Um, it is not my usual genre, as you know, and we have talked about, I do not like horror, even as satirical as this kind of goofiness, <laughs> this kind of was, it wasn't scary, it was more goofy. Um, so, so I, I take that in mind, um, when I give my grade, but I guess in terms of just my overall entertainment value or enjoyment, I'm not going to lie. I have to give it a C. I have to give it a okay. C plus, mm-hmm. um, because I just, when I, when I watched it the first time, you know, I watched it just kind of trying to understand what the story was about, all of that. And then on my second watch, I was just like, I just really don't, I really don't enjoy this journey. Like I didn't, I didn't enjoy the journey that I went on. Now the cast, as you mentioned, was fantastic. 
Absolutely. Um, which is definitely a saving grace of it. And there are so many great messages within it. So that mm-hmm. saves it as well. Right. And the relatability for me and for you as black women girl, and knowing about, because we, we once we get into the hair stuff, girl, yes. oh Lord Jesus. And we should talk about, I guess, how we currently are wearing our hair as a part of this <laughs> discussion. Yes. That's such a but, great idea. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> but so, so my grade, I think I'm, I feel confident right now. And if I change it after we finish, I will do so. But right now I'm giving it a C plus. So what were your thoughts and what was your, what was your rating? All right, Ashley, my grade for this film is a D plus. Oh, so, okay. Okay. Pros. Great talent. Okay. Yes. yes. I, excellent work even on the young lady her first starring role i think she did i think she did wonderful yeah she embodied Um, that she embodied it uh concept love it love the concept of it um you know being a black woman knowing the struggles of natural hair knowing and understanding wholeheartedly what creamy crack is and what it can do for you (laughs) lord um I, i was there and the fact that there there was black talent both in front and behind the scenes so yes yes so this is why it's not an f <laughs> okay mm. so Ooh, what but, i'm scared of the cons hit them the cons simply would be the execution more specifically the closure of the story okay. like I, um and then okay. to your point i I watched it, you know, the first time, you know, being spooked out by, you know, not knowing this film, right? But by mm-hmm. the time I watched it the second time, I didn't, I didn't get the joy I was hoping mm-hmm. for. Um, yeah. I, I was really trying to get the jokes. Um, the, the most I got, <laughs> yeah, I was really trying to get the joke, the humor of it all. Um, but it, it just. And I'll explain later in the episode. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. We, Lena was the only comedic relief between her and, um, yeah, Jay? I think it was pretty much Lena. Well, no, I feel like much, it was pretty much Lena for me. That was obvious, right? I agree. Yeah, she was the obvious humor in the show, so or yeah. in the film. So with that being said, we're going to give our spoiler, spoiler alert. Mm-hmm. And we're going to go a little bit deeper. Um, so I want to talk about your first impressions before I get started on the actual recap. So first first impressions, themes, highlights you want to talk about now that we're past our spoiler alert. Yeah. First impressions. First of all, I did enjoy that it was a a throwback in time. I did enjoy that this was set in the late eighties, early nineties, um, and just kind of that nostalgia of that time, especially yes. about music, because this is really centered around the evolution of, of like R&B, R&B hip hop music of that New time. Jack sound. Like yes. That new Jack shit as going as, yes. as to be said. Um, so, you know, I really enjoyed that aspect of it. Um, I don't, I'm trying to think of any other first impressions I have to block. Again, I went into it, not necessarily skeptical, but just thinking like, you know, what is this really, what's, what's the focus of it really going to be? Cause I didn't want to read any reviews before I watched it. I really yeah. wanted my perspective yeah. to be fresh and my own. Same. So, so, you know, I, again, whenever I can really support black artistry, I want to make a point to do that. So I definitely appreciate it. Yeah. This, this predominantly black cast, these black creatives and, and the fact that there's this platform. So many legends, so many legends. This platform to allow for them to kind of talk about something again, that we as black women very much relate to. So, you know, that's really all I have as far as first, first impressions. What were yours? Um, same. I really, I guess the thing that I did enjoy was trying to find the correlation between um, who this made up character is and how they relate to real life. Mm, um, okay. uh, I, the biggest example being Kelly Rowland playing a Janet Jackson like character. Yes. Down Loved to some everything of the about dance that. Moves. Some of those yes. dance moves were Janet like flat out. Uh, flat out. No, no deny. No deniability, right? 
Um, yes. In terms of themes, um, colorism, um, respectability, politics, and then this is all together, Black culture, Black women, woman culture, hair culture, right? Absolutely. <laughs> like, like, it's all encompassing. And so, um, so with that being said, I'm going to get started um, with the recap here. So as I mentioned, ambitious young lady named Anna, she, um, you learn really quickly, it's, um, it's, it starts off with her being a young woman. And when I say young woman, actually a little girl getting her first perm, she's staying with her cousin um I, i'm not exactly sure what happened to her parents were you able to gather what happened no and it actually took me until much later to understand that that was her cousin i think i originally wrote older sister older adopted sister because she mentions like oh you've been with us for a year i was like what is this dynamic mm -hmm. you know yeah. i was confused at first but but yes i don't i never understood what happened to her parents yeah so she is obviously in love with radio and she has her own imaginary radio uh, show and um while she's playing she's she's getting her first relaxer Woo. and um ashley you and i know this very well it is a rite of passage oh, <laughs> for a black little girl to get her first relaxer but it goes terribly terribly wrong Poor to, baby to the tune of her um, forming some form of alopecia, frankly, in the back of her head because hair was no longer able to grow ever since then. Yeah, permanent, it seemed like permanent, I mean, you can consider it a permanent scar. It left a permanent yes. scar um, yes. in the back of her head. And again, to the point that unfortunately, this child was not able to go to a beautician. It was her older cousin, Linda, doing it. Yeah. who was doing this in the house. So, And, you know, I also wanted to highlight really quick when her her cousin made such a s sly comment saying, oh, well, maybe we could finally pass the sisters because her cousin was lighter than she was, but her hair mm -hmm. was really straight and yes. long. And yes. little Anna was uh you know beautiful black little girl with curly fro afro hair her and natural so, hair her natural hair i mean it and, was like it was like sorry to cut you off it was like no they were setting the stage immediately for this idea that it's going to be natural versus straight that was yes. immediately the dynamic i'm like oh okay i see what this is going to be like okay but we are talking about the 80s and guess what that is what was it back in the day mm -hmm. so we fast we um uh fast forward to la 1989 and anna is again still ambitious looking for new opportunities so she can thrive um in the music journalism business yes sorry can i say two two quick things before you move on to to when she of when course you, you see her background so one thing that came up for me my second watch i didn't catch the first watch is that first scene after the hair debacle with the relaxer is you see a scene of these trees and this hair and this truck that yes. you don't know what the importance of this is when you see it i was like i didn't catch that my first time but i caught it my second time yes that went on during the credits thank you ashley yeah. i actually did write that down but um it is very pivotal because very when you watch it the first time you have no idea where where's the association i was like what this is obviously um signaling plantation ish type of situation right. deep south um you know it wasn't necessarily a chain gang but it was that imagery of people working you know in line to you know pick it was some it was very hair like it was substance. very plantation vibes like you said so it's like is this going to be slavery like what is the the reality of this situation and then the only second thing that i was going to note real quick was the second time i watched it i noticed all the vanessa williams hair hair placement spots my second time yes, the very I saw that opening the first time. shot yes, was, it a was vanessa, vanessa on that relaxer and i was like yes, hold on i saw I didn't that catch that and then she's on the billboard yeah um, in la and yeah in that in that next shot so again just the fact that there are these this these eggs these um easter eggs that are throughout mm -hmm. the film that i didn't necessarily catch you may not catch your first viewing but mm -hmm. you may 
go back and catch the second time. So those are my only two, Delora. Sorry, let's Yeah, and excellent points. And I actually did notice Vanessa Williams because I was like, Vanessa Williams in my notes. I'm like, look at that. So, um, so Anna is like pretty much wanting to get in where she can fit in. Like she's interviewing for um, a rock radio um Mm -hmm. host position and they're not interested she is a beautiful black young woman who is all the way natural with Mm -hmm. no you know it's not even pressed right so Mm -hmm. um but they're just not interested in her look and and you see her go into work and um she bumps into um James Vanderbeek <laughs> out of nowhere, but you, you, you get a lot of, um, you get the view of her workplace from her perspective. There's, um, you know, white women with their blonde flowy hair, whipping it, you know, whipping their hair back and forth. And <laughs> even um, for her section of where she worked, uh, it was called culture, which mm-hmm. is the equivalent to RBET. And they are going through um a merge not a merger but a a change in leadership Mm -hmm. and so um Vanderbeek being the boss shows up and pretty much saying your new boss is out who is Aetna and the new boss is in and it is Vanessa Williams as Zora she is a um former model and personality and so she's supposed to I think um, she said she was supposed to be the first black supermodel on the show, yes. in the show's universe, right? Which obviously yes. she was first bl- black, was it Miss America? Miss America, yes. So it's like funny that Vanessa yes, Williams that. had that significance, yes. Exactly. And, you know, I think it's also important to realize, like, we're talking 1989. This is like the beginning of a new decade. Uh, mm-hmm. It's approaching. It's the last decade of a century. So the, the you know, powers that be, James Vanderbeek character, so to speak, was looking for some changes. And so the name of the channel, again, is called Culture. And they're going to give it an image re- remake and call it Cult. <laughs> Boo. This is like uh oh, so on the nose, so on the nose. Can so, we talk about that speech that James Vanderbeek gave during okay, the passing of the mantle? I just have it down in caps. That speech by James Vanderbeek, because he essentially gave this spiel in my mind that was supposed to seem relatable, but came off to me as so such like a white male privilege, arrogant asshole type of comment. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like Mm -hmm. we didn't need you to come in and recognize that our music is the music of the future because that's essentially what he's saying. Like I recognize the greatness in this niche genre of music as it was considered at the time that this is the future. Like, motherfucker, we didn't need you to tell us that we know that. Like, what is your point? And so for for him to um, be the one kind of passing the baton, I think seems so significant to me, especially in this universe that is being created in this movie, because I think the idea of steel white dominance is a theme throughout this whole film. Yes. So that's yes. why I think that him being the person who's put in, in place to kind of help pass the baton to this almost gentrification of the station yes. and of the, well the um the the efforts that they have been making under Edna who has decided to step down which yes. I had written down at first was this a forced step down or was, was this legit the, because you know you've been thoughts, in those exactly. meetings Absolutely. you know you've been in those meetings you're like hold on why would you decide to leave something you probably loved you probably put your heart and soul into? I was gonna say she probably was there from the beginning exactly like, and and Anna was her assistant so you see yes. the reaction of people like Anna and also um the other talent and other yes. um, people who were part like of the station is like what? and sister soul exactly exactly so I just wanted to mention yeah. that because again I just think and especially because of the significance as we know that James Vanderbeek is going to play in this in this film yes it was just so interesting to me as far as that particular moment in the show but that's that's really all I want to touch fact, on and again 
I, I don't know if I should bring it up now, but he's barely in the film, but his presence is very much felt throughout. Same with Laverne Cox. Yes. Barely in the film, but her character yes. is pivotal. A- absolutely. So it's worth saying, as Ashley was mentioning, um, the changing of the guard, so to speak, um, moving towards this new innovative and then putting more of a focus on Black culture and music. Um and so it's worth mentioning that um, after the meeting, they are all looking at um, music videos and they notice that our Kelly Rowland, our legend, who's playing Sandra, again, Janet Jackson type, is debuting a new do. And I love the commentary during this time because people are like, look at that is that is you know they're trying to determine what exactly is this on her head right Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so and I love it because I think it may be true that we probably weren't introduced until around this time I because before then there was you know wigs uh pressing pressing curl um, uh relaxers and then yeah. it may be um, true. I didn't look it up to even to consider. You no, know, I yeah, didn't need that. But to true. me, that that kind of makes sense to me personally. Mm-hmm. But yeah, as far I as the era goes, how, yeah, and I love how they were talking about. Is that a new nose? <laughs> yeah, because Which at is, the end of the day, she is a celebrity, right? Like, like the character that Kelly Rowland plays, who Sandra is supposed to be Janet Jackson esque, and Janet Jackson have nose job during that every, time exactly they've had so, multiple nose jobs yes if we're so it's like it again yeah it's like again an homage to janet in that sense that that was a time where janet was transforming physically in certain yes. ways that people were probably taking note of and obviously the relevance of the jacksons in terms of black culture black musical culture yes uh, makes a lot of sense that sandra is going to be so influential throughout this film but another point that i think was uh great that you made with that was just the fact that Again, this shines a light on the progression of Black women's hairstyling throughout our history, right? Our because, history in America. <laughs> yeah, we've gone yeah. through so many shifts and, oh, we got the hot comb now and going back to yes. Madam C.J. Walker, you know what I mean? Yes. Like, there's just been so many transformations. And obviously, right and now, evolutions. we're back into this. Exactly. We've been back into this love of, um, of, of natural hair, and that's a beautiful thing, mm-hmm. but it's definitely interesting to think about where we were back in 1989 in terms of our aesthetic and in terms of what was acceptable. And again, always going back to kind of that, that white acceptance, right. That is prominent throughout this film that we did things because we were trying to appeal. And our proximity to whiteness, whether it is the color of our skin or Mm -hmm. the texture of our our hair. hair. Absolutely. And you know, how that, how that affects our trajectory in a in a professional sense as well and i think one of the things too that makes uh, to give it a give a, a a kudos to the choice of career path is that where is that more potentially sometimes potent than if you are a figure in media you know yes. if you mm-hmm. are on camera the expectations of you as a black person and specifically a black woman are very high Ashley, we just got Crown X approved. Exactly. In this country in the last year or two. I'm being generous saying two. I am just now seeing women journalists, at women of color, wear braids. Exactly. Wear their hair in their curly form. Mm-hmm. And, and every time I see them, I, I like, I get so proud of them because I know it's a risk every time. Absolutely. Depending on your market. But if mm-hmm. you are not authentic to yourself and, 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 you know, I'm going to speak to my experience really quick. Um, when I first moved to the state that I'm in to work um, my corporate job, it took me three years to muster up enough confidence to wear my hair braided in, mm. in my, well, I actually didn't do braids. I did Senegalese twist. Mm-hmm. And the, for, Which, the most part, for any non-black women listening is a, a, it is a more, one could consider it a slightly more refined version of braids. Yeah. At least not, in my opinion. They're not quote unquote dookie braids. 
<laughs> or or box braids or box, or box braids. braids yeah. yes and they had the curly in so you had the illusion of your hair being curly when down and everything like that but you know terrified ashley terrified and even then you know i'm no longer at that organization but i would be lying to you if i have not had moments to myself that said what if i never did my hair braided like that would that would i have been able to go a little bit further like did my hair intimidate Mm. them Mm. in any kind of way that would make them say oh no not her Right. Absolutely. I totally relate and understand. And I have had the experience because for years, I always wore my hair relaxed, especially when I was first introduced into the workplace. And it has only been Mm -hmm. when I've gone through my hair journey to come to a natural state that I started doing box braids. Well, actually, it wasn't even then. I think I first started because I was going on a trip and, you know, I wanted to change it up regardless. I had a white man at work I've had the conversation where he said, Ashley, why are you wearing your hair like that? You look better when your hair is straight. I have had that conversation. So it is not an illusion or it's not something that's just on television. It is reality that many people live and have experience when it comes to how black women, how we wear our hair. And so the point now obviously is impacting a lot of black men as well as they make more bold decisions and change their hairstyles. I just had a conversation recently with a a black guy who works in a predominantly white environment in corporate America and was told, are you trying to grow dreads? We don't allow dreads in here. And he was like, no, I I wasn't because he wasn't. And then all of a sudden he made a decision. No, I am growing dreads because you know what? I'm going to rebel against what you are trying to tell me I'm going to do with the hair that grows out of my head. And not to go in a deeper rabbit hole, but I don't even like calling them dreadlocks anymore because that's what the British soldiers called the quote unquote rebellion of um, the Jamaican people back in the day when they grew out their hair, they, Mm. you know, they were able to, the British people identified them as dreadlocks. Like they're terrified. I just call them locks now, but you better tell us some history. I didn't even know that. (laughs) So I'm just like, I'm just trying to be impeccable with my words. If you know what I mean? Well, then we're going to call them locks moving (laughs) forward. (laughs) Well, Oh, you know, I, I'll talk to the individual just to verify because my mom has sister locks, but you know what I mean? It's like, I'm no, not going to give their power like absolutely. that anymore. It's reclaiming something that was said against us that was considered a negative that we are no longer going to tolerate. Absolutely. But I didn't mean to get us on that, on the no, divergence, even though I think no it's, a, it's a, absolutely a part of the discussion, right? Yes. What's, the, what's the next step that we're going down in this, in this film? So we, Again, they're analyzing Sandra and her evolution with her hair. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the things I wanted to talk about before we move on is um, Sister Soul. She was, she, she, they were saying, oh, well, if it's a weave, um, that means that someone else's hair. And Sister Soul was like, I don't want anyone's dead energy on me. And I thought that was very interesting because I have... I have a complex relationship with, uh, you know, weaves and frankly, because I'm allergic to them. So, (laughs) and it's like, and then the other part of me, is like, why I don't, I don't knock anyone from wanting to wear a weave, but you know, for me, I just, it's just not something that works for me right now. All right. So from there, um, Anna goes to Julius and Ooh. you are under you understand quickly that there is history there. And he so not nonchalantly tells her that their whole situation ship is over. What an asshole. And she's just like, well, didn't we just have a, a quote unquote conversation just the other day? And now you're seeing somebody else like, when did this happen? Girl, it wasn't even a conversation the other day. It was, we just got down in your dressing room this afternoon, sir. What do you mean? (laughs) What do you mean you're suddenly seeing somebody else? And he was such a coward with it, too. He's like, "Uh, you know, I'm seeing somebody else. Uh, You heard me, right? Like, I think for me, so 
I do not judge people on the relationships they decide to have, whatever. We all do our thing. We grown. But for me, it was the not only lack of communication in that moment, but the seeming disregard for her feelings. And obviously Woo. the rapport or relationship they had established, it's obviously not a clear boundary between you guys in terms of what you were, what you were doing. So it just felt so cold hearted. I called it literally ruthless breakup moment. He said, he said, you know, I didn't mean to cross the line. And she was like, we've been crossing the line for years. So it's Four not like she's just been messing with this man for a couple months. You've been messing with him for years. And this is the way he, I just, ooh. It was Delora, gross. Delora, was don't gross. get me going on that scene, girl. Because I was like, mm-mm, sir. Mm-mm. Yes. So um, from there, she's dealing with this heartbreak. And um, we we get a chance to go see a little bit of her home life. Um, oh, she's... oh, before, before you get to that, can we just talk about, talk about kick me when I'm down the bathroom scene where she's crying after he says what he says. And the coworker is trying to supposedly console her and is like, listen, don't worry. Why would they get rid of you? You barely cost the network anything. Oh, Girl, yes. I have damn. <laughs> yeah, that that's true. And I, I I didn't highlight this before. Part of the reason why um, Anna was looking for work somewhere else is because she's been stagnant at her job at yes. at, at Culture, working for um, Edna. She has been trying actively to become a f- um, on air person, but mm-hmm. it was Julius who stole that job from her. Oh my and goodness! And she let it happen because again mm-hmm. they were in a situation ship. But you know, money before. Um, Hose? Honey, I don't know. <laughs> Money for hoes. We can call it. We can call it what it is. Um, yes, yeah, she had been an executive assistant, Edna's executive assistant for four years, and we'll yes. get to this later. But she's one of those people who is so undervalued because she consistently has delivered not only great ideas but great. implemented ideas at that station and has been but they completely always... overlooked. They they ex- excuse um I forget, <laughs> exclude her every time. That was and one of the most upset, upsetting things about the whole film for me. Yeah, that frustration. Yeah. That frustration yeah. was palpable. Like, girl, everybody's Absolutely. stealing your ideas. Everyone is stealing your opportunities. I can see why your hair start killing everybody. But anyway. <laughs> After feeling rejected by Julius, she had a meeting with the new boss, Zora. And there, she pretty much, um, they were, it was pretty much getting to know you. She's obviously intimidated by um, her boss, but then she let her her hair down by giving her uh, this idea that uh, would work well for the network. And it's essentially the concept of um, what one on six in park was, right? Exactly. You know? Or TRL and TV. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And so um, Zora being the boss that she was, she, she listened to her and she gave her the, um, the exam, uh, I'm sorry, <clears throat> the advice to get your hair done, girl. Mm. uh if you want she said, to uh, succeed wh- who does your hair who does your hair like right it was an insult it was an insult and she essentially said i do my own hair and obviously it wasn't good enough and so she was like if you want to if you want to succeed you should get your hair done here's my hair lady you should call so we then is there anything else you want to mention in the scene uh, this, this is the opportunity that Anna has been waiting, not Anna, Anna, Anna has been waiting for to but It's my fault. Uh, I currently have a toddler who enjoys Frozen, so <laughs> I apologize yeah. for mispronouncing her name. Anna. No, it's okay. I still call, I still call Rihanna, Rihanna, even though it's supposed to be Rihanna. It's all good. Love you, Rihanna. Love you. Um, so this is, this is a chance that she kind of saw as potentially a way to, again, further her career. And it did seem like it was going to be an opportunity because, right, um, Vanessa Williams said, well, I don't need an assistant, but how about an associate producer? Because, yes. you know, Anna went in prepared. She had a whole portfolio when she Vanessa did. was like, well, listen, here's, your, here's my pitch. And Vanessa's like, well, listen, I need X, Y, and Z. She already had it prepared, guys. Like, that's amazing. And it, that- and it made it clear that, like, her stagnant um, in her career had nothing to do with her talent. Absolutely nothing. And this is also when we find out that Julius, who, again, is her um, ex-situationship partner, the yes. block, the show that he 
uh, is the VJ on was Anna's idea. It was her idea. And that Julius was all of a sudden decided because Grant, who is Jane Vanderbeek's character, supposedly saw something in him, which speaks to sexism, a level of sexism that was going on within that office. He was a receptionist. He was a receptionist and was promoted to a VJ for Anna's show. So again, it's pivotal just to show the setback she was feeling and having within her career and, and what that can be like as a black woman um, in your job field or your career path. And then the only other thing I was going to say is this is the first time that we see something seems amiss with Vanessa Williams hair. Yes. It's we moving get our first... from side to side and it's creeping and crawling. Like what the hell is going on with this lady's hair? <laughs> exactly. Excellent. Excellent points, Ashley. And so um, we finally get to this home dinner. Okay. <laughs> Again, I apologize. Um, I, I was getting ahead of myself. So her uncle, played by Blair Underwood, is into history, specifically African-American history. And he gives her this book of slave tales. And, um, and one of the stories in particular is called The Moss Hair Girl. And so she takes the, she, she gets her dinner. She's also taken care of by her aunt because she's, because she hasn't been able to advance in her career, she's been living off this lowly assistant money and she lives in a crappy apartment and, and her, her landlord is increasing her rent. And so her aunt. And Blair Underwood said, are you still interning at that place? (laughs) Yes like dang sir yes and uh, it's also um worth mentioning her cousin is there with her boyfriend and they're telling Mm -hmm. about their tales and and um overall successes and so you kind of see the 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 family dynamics um in that in that moment they also mentioned that she also mentioned because she kind of dismissed the the story the the that Blair Underwood is trying to tell that everyone there has a doctorate which being a black family to, in my opinion, was very significant in terms of the importance Extremely. of education, right? That's why that's why the Cosby Show was so important. You had two professional Black parents. Absolutely. That was not the norm, but because you had those images, you know, we, we were able to imagine ourselves in that space. So, mm-hmm. and not to say it was not happening before the Cosby Show, but unfortunately, as a whole, that was, that was not the norm. Mm-hmm. And so um, Anna goes uh, goes back with this book. And so we go into the next scene. Hold on. Before you, I'm, I feel so bad because I don't mean to keep interrupting you. I literally just, just have, I know, no, you're fine. for the sake of time. I know, but, <laughs> but there was, I know, girl, I know. I'm so sorry. I have to, Blair Underwood gave, because I don't know what it is. I, I love a good speech. Blair Underwood gave this amazing speech. And I just had to monologue. read. Yeah, he really did. He read he read her a little bit. Like he's her uncle, but he was very offended when Anna basically dismissed this folklore book that he was give, passing on, which is a slave folklore book. Yes. And his the beginning of his speech, I only wrote the beginning. How does one group of people subjugate another? You subjugate people by telling them their science is superstition, their faith is heresy and their wisdom is make-believe. They called the Native Americans savages, and they called us. Well, what didn't they call us? It was so powerful. Extremely. And again, Thank you for bringing my, it up, Ashley. No, it was just one of my favorite messages and themes, as you, you pointed out at the very beginning, as far as what I felt like the art of this film was trying to impart, right? Because he even, yes. and I didn't write it, he says something about you were indoctrinated into urine, European standards before you were even able to figure out who you were. Like, Period. damn, sir. Period. Period. Okay. It was- powerful powerful Powerful. again Blair Underwood someone you don't see a lot but when he is on camera it's impactful yes I actually wrote down one of his quotes later on when we see him again but I'll I'll hold that it's a goodie it's a goodie for sure and then Anna I mean Anna gee I'm gonna call her Anna too (laughs) Anna blamed blamed her rent hike it sounded like on gentrification do you remember that as a part of yes, the scene yes but, the, but it's way worse right it's we worse. come to realize it's way worse 
Yes. She's like, oh, the yes. white folk are moving back in. Mm, yeah. girl, that ain't it. That ain't why. <laughs> that ain't it. That ain't it, baby. That ain't it. So Anna decides to get her hair did. Okay. Mm. She goes to the salon. She goes to Vir- Virgie's. Is that how you pronounce it? Virgie's. I think so. Yeah. And they're booked and busy. Okay. Um, she she would have had to come back months after um, setting up an appointment because that's how book and busy they were. Mm-hmm. And so um, Anna sees Virgie herself played by the legendary Laverne Cox. And she pleads with her and say, please, I'm just trying to move up and move up at work. This is going to be my key. This is going to be my ticket. And Virgie has, um, a heart for her you know a soft spot for her she's like okay i get you girl you'll just be my last client for the day and so i want to also mention that it is 450 dollars to get this hair done y'all know and how much them styles be costing come on i mean that that's a pretty penny back in 1989 absolutely by the way. she charging them 2020 prices okay <laughs> That's she was charging them 2020 prices. That is exactly <laughs> what I'm saying. Okay. Yes. And there, it was almost ritualist, ritualistic of, I can't even say that word. Please, please. Um, I'm, I apologize. <laughs> Rich, were you trying to say ritualistic? Yes. How okay. they chose the hair. And Ugh. so, um, it was so disturbing. She, she takes Anna to this back room where there's just hair hanging, right? Ugh. And she just tells Anna, you know, it'll find you. It'll speak to you. I think I'm getting chills. Ugh. <sighs> Ugh. So she finds her piece and um and and Virgie gets started. And so this whole scene made me extremely uncomfortable simply because I have never been that uncomfortable getting my hair done ever in my life now are there moments of discomfort absolutely but i'm not crying if if why would i be crying i would i would say we're done i don't know ashley have you ever had anything like that happen no um i mean i have definitely gotten styles that as you're getting them they are uncomfortable i did do my first half so in recently and Mm -hmm. i said never again And that is me being someone who gets a lot of hairstyle changes because I just, for one, I have a lot of hair myself. So I was like, Ashley, why did you do this? That was one thing. Why do I have this bull in my hair when I have my own hair? And the other part of it was I did not enjoy the the braiding and then the sewing in of the hair thereafter. Like I, I, Mm -hmm. it was an uncomfortable process for me. Um, It was uncomfortable for days afterwards, the same as you see Anna Mm -hmm. go through. And it's just not a preferred thing for me i love braids i love to get a braid in my hair yeah but a sew-in like i think that was why this is a little bit more palpable for me because i was like girl a sew-in and so one of the reasons why it was so painful for her is because she said she had she never her gotten her hair well she said she'd never yeah. gotten her hair done before yeah so if you've never gotten your hair done before and you start with a sew-in baby yeah that's a big step you do find out later, and I'm going to bring it up now, that she she never got her hair done. Um, it, it is brought up plainly um, later on in the film, and that she's quote-unquote tenderheaded, which I don't believe anyone's tenderheaded, but that's because, I, I don't know, it's like the equivalent of uh, Loch Ness Monster as far, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you know what's funny? I will say one thing. I never used to be tenderheaded whatsoever because I, but I always got my hair done. Like I've been getting my hair done for a very long time. Yeah. And the less that you manipulate your hair, the more sensitive your scalp is. So I could see how it would have been very uncomfortable again for her to go from never getting anything yeah. to going to a sewing because I get my hair done all the time and it was yes. still very uncomfortable for me getting a sew in so girl you went out the gate hard yeah. that's like that's like you a virgin and you go for 10 inches like baby oh, we gotta Lord. we gotta ah, ease ah, we gotta ease into ah, this thing you know what i mean you know you, you can't come out the gate you can't dead. come out the gate that dead. Hard, i can't baby. do this anymore i cannot <laughs> 
I can not. Okay. So what I was going to say as a pro tip when I do get my hair braided is I always take two Tylenols before. Yes. I always take yeah. it before and then I take it um, a couple, you know, several hours later and I keep that, you know, going for at least the first two days. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> because I did, I did with the sew in too. I don't have to a regular braid, regular braid. Shout out to my girl Ukali who does my hair here. She is so wonderful with her sensitivity, but the sew in, Jesus. Yeah. No. And I also wrote here, I was like, beauty knows no pain, but um if she was tender headed uh what, what did i say uh but she was tender headed i wouldn't be crying on the slime uh, chair okay so basically what i'm trying to say is beauty knows no pain but if it's that painful i'm not gonna stay in the seat like Girl. i don't understand it I, I i don't get it this child passed out <laughs> she, she passed, did she passed out she never didn't. have i ever and then they were making it so graphic with like the bloody scalp. Can I be honest? Yes. That was a part that I couldn't watch. Like I was like, like had to turn my head and was yeah. cringing. I, I, because again, getting your hair done, you know, there are times that your scalp does get mm -hmm. torn in some way yes. or traumatized. And so it was not like, like that. I was like, oh, no, not no, like no, that. No, no, my hair just have never hurt me to that extent. But it was still like, oh, the idea, right? It was just like, yeah. oh, with the, the needle. No, please stop. Please stop. It was, it was a little traumatic. <laughs> yes. But the next scene, she is, well, not even the next scene. While she's there, uh, Kendra shows up with Jermaine. Sandra and, shows up. Her, oh, her, her Sandra. idol. Yeah, yeah. Her Thank idol. You. Kelly Thank Rowland. You. Mm -hmm. you know what I just did? Forgive me. I just put Kelly's name and Sandra's name together and called her something <laughs> that was not her name. So please forgive me. What'd you call Sandra. her? Kendra? You call I did her call her Kendra. Kendra. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Y'all know who we talking about. Sandra, Sandra. She shows up with Jermaine and Sandra got her hair wet. Yeah. And we yeah. also see that her eyes these context situations are glowing okay she has Look, yellow eyes looking like michael jackson and thriller that and was thriller. all i kept thinking when i tell you i was i was so terrified as a child at that a part thriller? at the Aww. end i okay. remember the first time i saw it and i was just like <gasps> his eyes Girl. I was just, this was the only point in time in history of my fandom of Michael Jackson that I just found him so attractive. Like, I love oh, me some Michael Jackson Michael. and Thriller. Yeah, peak. I was like, oh my God, you're so, like, you can come, some, he had perfect teeth when he was smiling in the theater. I was like, oh my God, stop. <laughs> you wish that he loved himself, right? Aww, like, Michael. Oh, Michael. Well, anyway, I don't, you know, I digress from that because, you know, there are, things, <laughs> there are other, there are other reasons why that my, my opinions have changed, but let's keep going with, with the movie. Yeah. So it's also important to know before Anna left, um, Virgie gave her a bottle of product that she needs for, with her newfound beautiful flowing hair mm -hmm. um, to maintain it. So, a proprietary we, blend. Let's be clear. This is Virgie's own recipe, supposedly, yes. that she is making. That's going to be pivotal when we get further along. Yes. So, next day, um, Anna goes into the office. She has a new, uh, new attitude, and everyone is looking at her differently. People mm. are actually paying attention to her, and mm. it's, an, it's a new phenomenon for her. And um, what are your thoughts about, you know, strutting in like new, new, new woman, new hair, who this? New you know, hair, who, who this? <laughs> new hair, who this? So again, one of the reasons why this movie is so relatable is because we've all had those moments of hair transformation where you suddenly are getting so much attention and you feel so um beautiful and what regardless of you don't i don't even i don't think that she even considered the ramifications in that moment of why they all of a sudden thought that she was beautiful right you see the white um, every white yeah. person in that lobby turning and looking at her you see yeah. julius all of a sudden 
hey girl, you know, I got tickets to Janet. You want to, it's like, sir, all of a sudden you want some again because I got this sewing in my hair. You know what I mean? It's just, you, you almost, I almost didn't know how to feel because on the one hand, I'm like, yeah. I've been there. And on the yeah. other hand, it's like, but do you want to take this moment from this person who may not have always felt seen, loved, or appreciated and shit on that for her? I didn't. So I was like, okay, I, I recognize it for what it is, but she still has to grow. So. And I agree with you wholeheartedly. You, I understood how she felt in that moment. And I understood that, you know, how it feels to flip your hair back and forth and people like, oh, look at your hair, look at that. But then the other part of me rejects it immediately because it's like, my hair is beautiful when it's curly. Exactly. And again, I, the fact I, that we've gotten to that place. Yes. I, it made me wonder, like, does, has, is that what I wish it was one of those where I could almost have her in his thoughts as she's walking through, yes. because I just want to know, does she understand the relevance of why it's this sudden shift in attitude? Does she really, which I guess they kind of allude to the fact she does later on and, and consider herself like a sellout. But, you know, I just, I just kind of wonder, cause it was so palpable. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. palpable for us. Um, g- given that we've gone on our own hair journeys. Exactly. And so the transition at work continues from culture to cult. And uh, there's another meeting. And in this meeting, um, Zora, the head boss, is um, laying out plans for a new show. And essentially, Zora steals everything that Anna told her from her first meeting with her Mm. and took it as her own. Mm. and we also find out shortly after that the other person that julius was seeing was in fact zora herself ashley girl girl girl. and in the fact that she's the one who told her like zora flat out said well um because because anna is basically saying you know goes into her office after the meeting and says, you know, I didn't know kind of where I stood. She was like, Zora's like, well, listen, I invited you to this meeting to show you where you stood and you kind of let me down. And she's like, well, listen, why is it that Julius seems to get favor? And she was like, oh, is it because we're fucking? And Anna was like, what? She was like, oh, we're fucking. So the fact that Zora is the one who kind of puts that out there was was an interesting choice. But can I say also about in that in that planning meeting, one thing again, going back to the idea of of the hair discussion, why Mm -hmm. is it that Sister Soul, who had the natural hair, was the one who was told that her image needed to change. But Brooklyn, who has dookie braids, does not need to change her image. What was the significance of that? I wonder what was what was Justin's point? Is it supposed to be that braids are more culturally uh, acceptable in terms of European beauty standards than natural hair? Or is it that that just in his mind is the greatest contrast to white European beauty standards? I don't think, I don't think braids are necessarily more culturally acceptable, but I feel like her name was already Sister Soul, which is abrasive for most white people. (laughs) And that and, she supposedly had what was the name of her show? It was um um I forgot I forgot me too. Uh, me but too. it was very militant. It was very and and again I don't even want to use the word militant. It showed no. a lot of pride, a lot of pride. I was and gonna say so, it was something that actually is one that is um a, on a lot of radio stations, a lot of black radio stations. It's a, a segment, and I for some reason I'm blanking. Forgive me, mm-hmm. um but. You know what I realized, I'm sorry, just to go back real quick, that I interrupted you on talking about was the actual folklore story, Delora. You didn't get a chance Mm -hmm. to speak to the folklore story and the relevance of that as Anna is going through this journey. So when she goes to her family's house. Yeah, so the mom's hair girl. Yeah, so the mom's hair girl, we we actually get get it in pieces. And I, I intentionally did not go into much detail just because we... Um, later on the film you get the whole story but with this moss hair girl story essentially a slave girl goes into um the woods and she sees um some moss and she decides to put it on her head and then she realizes that something's wrong with this 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 moss and and that's where we pretty much left off unless you want to add anything else before you know, we get to the point where they reveal more about the story. 
Yeah, I'll just say that the imagery in the book, as you see Anna reading it, looks like the hair is attacking the white man who's also We're not in the there picture. Yet. We're oh, not that there wasn't yet. there yet? Okay, mm-hmm. sorry. I'm going too far. <laughs> Reel me back in, Delora. Let's go back still to the fact that Zora is fucking Julius and the fact yeah. that that's the first time, before I go too far, the first time we see Anna really pop off. She came out of her shell. I was when going she went to say I, that's where I was actually going to go because yeah. I felt like it was so refreshing that she she showed him how she felt because mm-hmm. she, she deserved. <laughs> Period. Okay. Point blank. And she just let him have it. Like, how dare you? And uh, he had nothing to say because he's stupid. <laughs> so. <laughs> Yet again, he showed his ass because yet again, he basically says, oh, well, listen, I need you to, I need you to be discreet with this. I mean, this is a gossipy office. I need you to not tell anybody. Listen, we had fun, but you know, that time has come to an end. And again, just goes to show his character. Again, there's nothing wrong with having situationships and having casual relationships, but you should still respect that other person and other person's feelings and I feel like he was being so disrespectful towards Anna throughout the course of the movie and this was just another point in time that he showed his ass absolutely um and I want to bring up this particular scene because I think it's worth mentioning so after all of this frustration what a day in the, at the office right she <laughs> says she's at her desk and then she ends up cutting her hand and it it drew blood and while she's tending to her finger her hair gets attached to this to the blood and it 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 goes into her finger practically and then she yanks it out and she's completely weirded out like what in the world just happened here so this is like the second time so like you mentioned before ashley the first time we saw something going on with the weave was with zora in um Anna's first meeting with her and then this was like the most significant second thing that's happened where the hair is alive okay right right some weird's going on with this weave something is going on and so the next scene is she goes back to her janky apartment um Mm -hmm. it's worth mentioning her cousin Linda comes to visit but then shortly after Linda's visit, uh, her landlord comes knocking on her door because he is looking for the increase in rent. Mm-hmm. And she doesn't have it, frankly, because it was a h- extremely high, high increase. $500. $500. Can you imagine? No. <laughs> no. That is crazy. Insane. And so... It's important to mention that this man is extremely aggressive. He's also inebriated and she feels threatened because he is physically intimidating her at this point. But he break he broke into her apartment. She he did, did not let him in. He let exactly. himself in because she had left the door unlocked when Linda left. Exactly. And so the hair saved the day. You want to go, you want to elaborate on this part, Ashley? Sure. So basically her landlord comes in. He is attempting to rape her. Yes. Um, Because if she doesn't have the money, he's going to get something out of this deal before he leaves. It was such a disturbing line. I think he says something like black pussy is passion or something disturbing like that. He says as he's attempting to do what he's going to do. She's trying to deflect the situation. She's trying to buy time. And um, essentially what happens is she finds a box cutter. She stabs him. That doesn't do anything. But again, we're getting the the sense all of a sudden her hair attacks him and it goes into his womb. So you start to get the idea of this hair is feeding off, off of blood, blood yes. and it basically ends up killing him so yes and so i put in my notes landlord body number one yeah <laughs> how convenient was it that she was able to toss him out the window into the dumpster <laughs> how i have something to speak to that um <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll speak to i'll speak to that towards the end okay, okay. so um the next day she continues on with her life right as if nothing (laughs) happens but before um that part 
um she sees that the ambulance found the man and um is taking care of it and they're investigating it but she goes on to work and so she's also running out of um she's also, also running out of product at this it's point also, too it's also worth note that another black female resident comes out and calls him a rapist. Yes. And thank spits you. on the ground. So he was a serial rapist. He was, he was, and, and he was hiking up her rent as well, but not as high as Anna's rent. So yes, that's an ex- excellent point. Um, so and, um, Anna goes to work and her hair is getting a little frizzy though. And she's running out of product and zora asked about it she started to ask her about her hair and 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 she mentioned she's like oh you're out of your product she's like is that enough and you get you get the feeling that they were starting to um make a connection on hair Mm -hmm. but julia shows up before there's actual time to um go any deeper i i think that scene is actually kind of funny because whenever i am in public when there's a black woman we can always talk about hair and have it legit be a full conversation right i talk about hair with everybody i'll be feeling bad sometimes i talk to you i mean it's like, a I can whole talk conversation i can talk it's to you all like, day how long have you been natural i mean what products do you use like like, <laughs> like it is a whole conversation hence what i was trying to get to in the beginning running things is like our hair culture is a culture okay it like is, it is we have cultivated our ideas and beliefs <laughs> around it okay and speaking of that um anna convinced us uh, uh, sister soul to convert mm to convert her hair to just go ahead and do it for for the job right because that's what that's that's honestly a very common cadence right you if you assimilate you you'll get further right and there's no real guarantees in that but we believe it and we've been saying it for forever (laughs) <laughs> it was also, they never, I mean, you have to imagine that while Anna thinks this is possibly in Yanni's character's best interest, just the soul's best interest to keep her job, I also feel like it was selfish on Anna's part in that moment because she had her own um, goals, which yes. was to fill out this roster for her new show so that she could be the VJ. So yes. it also made me sad that it was kind of like, oh, you got to sell her out to kind of further your goals as well. Cause essentially sister soul was the one who was like, listen, I'm not changing. This is who I am. So to have to conform, change your hair. She was the most significant changeover in that on the, on the, the show on the, in the movie. Yes. And it was. just really, it really hurt my feelings. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. So there's um, a very peculiar scene. Um, she's back into her apartment and it is that time of the month. Ugh. And her aunt has come to visit, right? And you pick up that her hair obviously loves blood. (laughs) And this, in this scene, I just really, I wrote, what the actual fuck is going on here? (laughs) Because this is too much. It is too much. The weave went down her pants. I was trying to figure out for a second. I was like, is it about to get her off? Like, what is happening? I think I wrote, I wrote, yo, did Anna's hair (laughs) go into her vag because she was on her period? Like, yo, y'all wild. Like, y'all wild. But first of all, have you ever opened a pad with your mouth? Because I was disturbed by that, too. I was like, ma'am. The choices actors make sometimes, it makes you question what you do on a regular basis. And it's like, no, no, this isn't normal, what she's doing. No, no. Why would I ever do that? Any man who watches that, no, we women do not open a pad with our mouths. That is not a norm that happens. This is not a piece of gum. This is not a stick of gum. I don't put packages of things in my mouth. Anyway, yeah, that was really (sighs) disturbing and disgusting. And it also, again, goes to show, too, I think it was one of the most 
uh, pivotal scenes at that point because that's the first time you saw that her hair not only feeds on blood but it it formed itself it it can like it it manipulated itself based on being fed it like smoothed it, it out like it was a brand new flat and iron. it got longer it, it got did. longer it did yes yes thank you for mentioning that Woo! so there's an industry party going on and anna is there and zora backstabs her again <laughs> It that just bitch. won't stop. So the, in, in this particular backstabbing <laughs> um, episode, the show, um, Anna's show, the 106 in Park or TRL video show was picked up by, um, or it was agree- approved by the executives. And she wanted to be the host. Well, when Zora presented to Vanderbeek's character, she presented it for herself and he agreed on that particular choice and so um anna is completely distraught and she leaves the party but before she leaves again usher is barely in this movie but this is worth mentioning he he approaches her and asks her hey i met you at the hair salon um how's your hair you know has is there anything has there been anything different that's happened with you? But she gets interrupted and we're not able to really see the end of that interaction, but I think it's worth mentioning. So Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that one because I didn't have that one written down. I also love that he said, nah, I don't do suits. Like my my G is like, listen, you go ahead and do your little mingling thing. I don't deal with these people. Yeah. yeah. And and Usher had the slope, guys. Like his 80s style was so on point. I loved it. Well, what I will say is this when it comes to this film, Bad Hair, I genuinely believe the, all the hair was bad. All the hair was bad. Not literally <laughs> the weave, but I mean, Jay he kept, uh, Jay Farrell kept brushing the wig on top of his head and it was gross. Like it who was. Did, who did they say he thought he was? Remind me, it was a celebrity that uh, they said he thought was it Eddie Murphy? I don't know. I know MC Hammer had a hairstyle like that, but no, I missed that. I didn't hear. It was some prominent, like when they first were, when Edna was was saying she was leaving that that meeting, they mentioned that he thought he looked like somebody, which again was just supposed to speak to the period. It's not really relevant, but um, but yeah, it was just it was it was just funny. It is bad hair across the board. Even the weave on top of Vanessa Williams' hair was questionable at times. Okay, man, because Vanessa got some beautiful hair too. She does. Honestly, who the person who had the best hair was Anna, but everyone else had awful, awful looking hair. That's a really good point because I did hate everybody's <laughs> weaves. It was I did. so bad. I mean, okay, well, uh, except for Sandra, Sister Soul before she got her weave. Yes, I yes, thought her hair was beautiful. You know. Yes, same natural Um, hairstyles were beautiful yes they were yes they were so she leaves the party distraught because again zora keeps backstabbing her like give me a break and And not giving her a heads up yes giving her a heads up is what bothered me more than anything especially about the hosting like we've had multiple conversations you couldn't have came and took me aside before that was just thrown in my face it's like it's almost like Zora doesn't even know how to have a decent relationship with anybody because the way she keeps doing Anna is like, does she expect loyalty? Like, I don't understand what the expectation is because at this rate, I I mean, I would expect her to leave, but then she doesn't have enough cachet to leave. But anyway, Mm. so there's a fight between Julius and Zora and Zora leaves storming away and um, Anna sees it and she you know now that she's looking all good and stuff with her new weave and all Julius is interested in um, them talking so they make their way to his apartment gross and they proceed to um, you know get it going and her hair starts acting up but I think her hair at this point I feel like was a reflection of how she felt absolutely because I agree. she was essentially having revenge sex with him I agree 
because you hear her when she first is talking to him when they get back to her house talking about the fantasies she had about their relationship and kind of shows you the difference in where she thought they were or the hope she had for them versus yes. him just seeing her as this casual fling yep. who he can sleep with and treat however so I agree at that point you think the hair is possibly serving in her best interest right the first time you see it do something it was because she was about to get raped this time it's because mm -hmm. she it made the, the sex may be consensual but he's yeah. an asshole so yeah but she they it, it felt her rage because it got bigger it got longer and bigger and um and she, she asking said, questions about she's women. asking questions about women and asking was she the best he ever had and Whoa. um the hair then proceeds to break the glass on the nightstand and stab him repeatedly. Well, actually, of point of note, she stabbed him. In that moment, the hair handed her, handed her the glass. That's and right. She stabbed that man to death. Yes. Yes, yes. So that yes. was significant because in that case, while she may have been seemingly kind of possessed, she took some culpability in that murder she did but her eyes were yellow so how they were know, they were she was possessed it's a, it's a great it's a gray area <laughs> <laughs> she and knew so, she wanted that man dead i have in parentheses girl i hope your hair kills him she wanted that man dead <laughs> wait in my notes i was like okay julia's hair body number two okay yes. Yes. so at this rate she is um stacking up bodies at this point and, and it was a it was a pattern of that point that it was killing men in the midst of sexual acts right first time actually, was forced second yes. time was consensual but yes. still both you're wondering at this point like oh is there is there a circumstance where you know this hair is is going to go off the rails or is it just going to be you don't know yet you don't know but she does leave his apartment distraught because again the her hair sucks up all his blood yeah so she runs to the nearest payphone because this is 1989 and she calls her uncle's house where she got a hold of her cousin linda and she's begging her to tell her finish telling her the story of the moss hair girl do you want to <laughs> go you do want to talk about this point now ashley uh sure um i was gonna say too we this we see that truck again that truck that we saw at the yes, beginning of the film the be makes another point. appearance and we're like yes. what the hell is this truck about um but anyway yeah this is just where she's asking linda to finish this fit, tell her more of the story and again we start hearing more about the fact that this hair kind of in the story takes on a life of its own mm -hmm. um it, I can't remember if this is the point where it says that it that that she was being told the lady the slave who was being told in the story hey this hair is not necessarily what you think it is actually yes witches. this is at the part yes okay it's actually witches and that they they need blood they feed on blood to get strength to be able to come back and take over the the person's body so mm -hmm. um, basically in the story the slave gets killed. But everybody thinks that she's dead, but I mean, not dead, but they think she's still alive, but it's really supposedly the witches take turns like being in her head, which as we know, her. becomes very significant as we're moving on along this story. Exactly. So at this point, she's just like, I need a change. I need to, I need to go back uh, to where I was and get this weave out of my hair. So she did not make an appointment at, um, Ver, uh, Virgie's she goes to a natural hair salon where MC Light is the hairdresser um, I, I don't MC remember, Light? remember her name at the point at this point in time but it doesn't matter because MC Light is playing this role so <laughs> she's MC Light yes so at this hair, all natural hair salon um, there's a woman on the phone and then another woman comes in and it's Etna her former boss and mentor and Edna is feeling some kind of way because she felt like Anna is changing right before her eyes she's not staying true to who she was and um she jokingly says it's because I'm jealous because you look amazing with your weave but she goes in to say oh I'm so sorry you know I shouldn't have changed I should have called you and at that very moment, um, NC Light is trying to cut the weave out her hair, and the weave is not having it. 
at all weave. at all the weave attacks the hairdresser it attacks etna and the young lady who was on the phone so the body count is now up to uh three four and five and yet again <sighs> we see this hair truck after she leaves this salon this hair truck is parked and is lingering after this fifth kill at this salon. And one quote that was important in that too, that was interesting to me, Edna told mm-hmm. her, in a perfect world, a woman would be able to wear her hair the fuck the way she wants to. You remember Absolutely. her saying that? I do. That's an excellent point. So it was like, is that supposed to be? Because again, at this point, I don't know how you felt, but I'm like, I'm getting mixed themes about <laughs> what you're trying to tell me mm-hmm. you feel or your messaging about hair. Yeah. Are you trying to say that straight hair and weave are the devil? Are you trying to say I should feel freedom in my blackness to wear my hair however I want? What is your messaging, Justin? So that I'll say I love that quote, but I'll still like Justin. What are you What are you saying to me? That's an excellent point because I honestly don't know. Yeah, <laughs> honestly, yeah, do not know. So we're gonna fast forward a little bit. So Anna uh, calls Azora because at this point she's the only person who would remotely understand what's going on. And um, she doesn't pick up, but the message that she leaves on her answer machine is, if I'm not available, more than likely I'm at the office. So Anna runs to the office, and when she gets there, she finds a dead person in the conference room. Cheryl. Cheryl. Poor Cheryl. And, And then to her left is Zora, who at this point, they finally have this conversation of saying oh my goodness your hair is doing this too one of the um funnier parts because we're finally getting more information about you know how another person is experiencing their weave um they're like it started off simple at first and then it started being insatiable and um Anna asked Zora a question and Zora's like, this was one of the only funny parts for me in this film, by the way. She's like, oh, I'm sorry. I haven't, I haven't talked to my Killer Weave support group lately. I don't know. <laughs> I laughed at that scene too. That was hilarious. And so Zora, yeah, one of the funnier parts. And uh, Zora go, you know, is convinced that it's only hair and let me cut it out. And guess what? Her weave wasn't having it either. Because she no. ended, up, ended up strangling her to death. Oof. So Harsh. Harsh. Anna is going through it. And she goes running to her uncle's house. Because she needs more answers. She needs to know if there's anything else that she needs to know about folklore. And so... Luckily, he's at home, and he proceeds to tell her that there is, you know, a history of hair with, um, obviously, the African slave, enslaved people and Native American people, uh, in particular, with the Native American people, they believe that their hair holds thoughts even after, even after death, and how, um, it's important that they had good thoughts so that no one could take their hair in death to have spell to make spells out of them. Mm -hmm. And um, this was the quote that I was going, I was alluding to earlier that he made that I absolutely loved when she kept probing him like, Hey, is there anything else, anything else about hair? And he was like, you know, the conqueror don't tell the conquerors, the conquered stories and so he's mm-hmm. essentially alluding to this is all that i have because our stories have been buried it's Absolutely. you know it yes. has been lost and and to your point earlier when he was talking about um you know how the dominant culture de- demonizes you know the 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 conquered culture yeah, yeah. so many things get lost as a result so. Absolutely. Again, he did not have a lot of scenes, but his scenes were very impactful. Message, as they Message. said on, as they said on, um, uh, what is the movie? Don't be a menace uh, while drinking a juice of hood. Message. Oh my gosh. 
I, I, I honestly have now seen that movie. I think oh, I've seen girl. parts of it, but that's what uh, I want to watch. Yeah, I didn't see it. I still have my black card. I'm still claiming it. Yeah, Wayne's <laughs> Brothers. You know, it's the Wayne's Brothers. You know. You know, I watch a lot of their films, but that is just mm-hmm. not the one. So at this point, she's still getting up, going to work because she goes to work, and um, it's raining outside. And one of the rules to getting a weave is not to get it wet. Correct. And she is given. She's she's this close to walking outside getting it wet because she's tired she's sick and tired of everything that's been going on but she does it and luckily she doesn't because when she goes upstairs since zora isn't there she gets to substitute uh to be her substitute to actually host her show Mm -hmm. and it is a dream it is an absolute dream for her she did such a fantastic job what do you think about her actually getting to where she was trying to get I mean, it was very bittersweet, right? Because it's like what all has had to happen and transpire and craziness for her to to get onto this stage. It didn't feel worth it. Um, it felt like what is about to happen next. Yes. Um, you still got this killer weave on your hair. You about to take out the audience. You know what I mean? I just didn't know exactly. what to expect because I'm excited for her career wise, but obviously we have all these other things going on in the background that take away from that moment to me as far as her career. So yes and i also think it's interesting because during this time we also see um sandra again she has the number one uh video on the um on the list and we get you get a chance to see her again um and then we get to the most pivotal part of the movie we see that while Anna is hosting the show. We we see her seeing someone in the background that looked a lot like Zora. Yeah. And come to find out, Zora is alive-ish. She's officially possessed by the weave demon or Woo! weave witches. <laughs> yeah. Very scary stuff. Very scary stuff. And this is probably the most scary part out of the whole show for sure. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a struggle in the office building where um, unfortunately we see uh, Zora's assistant get killed. Again, Cheryl is gone. Um, Brooklyn, played by Lena Waithe, is um, fighting along with um, Anna because at this point the weave the weaves are off the hook at this point is there anything notable you want to mention before i get to the good parts well i just thought it was alina waith was definitely hilarious during this her roll down the part where she said i can't die today i ain't been to church in 15 years <laughs> <laughs> that was hilarious uh very unfortunate that she ended up getting killed by sister soul sister soul by her sister soul homie, weave. right because yes. you know again to the point of sister soul that was the one that hurt me that she she went and got the weave because she was so against it and then it yeah. you know possessed her so so quickly it seemed so like of quickly. everyone of everyone I agree. um uh, so that was really all that i had and then at this point too i was wondering like because lena way says the thing about no nah, i didn't go to virgie's you know i got five hundred dollars to spend i went over here it was like so it's virgie's shop the only shop that sells this this possessed hair yeah that was a question that i had in that moment which i was like okay that makes sense if that's the case but that was really all i had um written before you get to the the pivotal climax of of the scene so uh, um anna gets essentially locked in a room and all around her is mad weave right and the attack um, kind guys the attack is coming the attack for. kind and she she thought she found a gun but it was lighter and then she she well girl she even hit zor in the head with that stiletto and zor still oh, ain't died Lord yes Jesus. yes 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 she was fighting for her life <laughs> she was fighting for her life what i did appreciate though is that every every time before she ran she took off those heels because these are facts Let's no one runs realistic. around in Let's heels. Come yeah. on now. Yeah. Yes. And so um, basically she finds the lighter. Oh, she finds the what she thought was a gun, but it's not. It's lighter. And then she was smoking a cigarette to almost surrender. Like, I don't know what else to do. And of course, 
black girl magic ingenuity kicked in and she's like what was the number one rule about this weave don't get it wet get it wet and what did she do she saw the fire uh sprinkler system the sprinkler system and she let that be on fire and then with water coming from the seedlings and scissors she's found at the desk she was able to cut the weave out of her hair and then essentially destroy uh, Zora and all the other possessed women with the witch weave. What I do love about the humor about this is growing up, I was not even active. I didn't swim. I didn't do anything because guess what? I did not want to get my hair wet right i must say that's not just a weave thing for any of us black women we know change even in natural hair there is a protocol there is a routine yes there are certain things depending on your style of choice that you do not do now i will say i have been fearless since i've been natural though when it, when it's a rainy day i actually get excited because i'm like oh moisture let the rain fall on my head it's okay i hope i reach that point the only time i do that is with my braids which is what i currently have in my head when i have (laughs) braids i am free to live la vida loca baby so so with that i i got the humor in that and then like how disaster is like don't get your hair wet and then you get your hair wet and it's like your weave dies like i got that but yeah so I'm going to close it out and then we'll have our um, final thoughts. So, so um, Anna was able to finally relieve herself of the demon hair and cut it completely off. And again, her hair looked awful in that scene, but again, bad hair. (laughs) 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 Um, And so she moves out of her apartment because I'm assuming uh, several things, like I'm assuming she's not working there anymore at at cult and or and or she decides to probably spend some time with her uncle and aunt to you know regroup yeah um so they didn't helped. specify but that makes sense yes um so her cousin helps her move out and but during the move out process she decides to look into the ingredients of this of the the what, what was it the patent um, the she called it a proprietary, proprietary ingredients that she made this hair product out of and by reading and looking up the ingredients of this product she found that it was made with pig's blood mm. Mm. so and laverne her, aka virgie knew exactly you knew what she was doing what she was doing and you know the other part of it too was <laughs> her line was funny she was like so this was the appetizer exactly because like, you what's funny too is the way they present laverne cox virgie's character she seems so ethereal almost she seemed witchy she seemed pretty witchy to me a little bit but never sinister during no. her scene right so you she, didn't she know dark. it was a little it was a tinge See, of darkness. i didn't get dark i always got like oh she's supposed to be like bohemian type of like earthy gotcha. vibe more so yeah. than anything so it was like at first i was like so is virgie in on this or is she an innocent bystander but at this point you realize she has to be in on it because she made these ingredients for or she made this product with these specific ingredients she knew what she was doing exactly and so the the film ends with Anna or Anna <laughs> let it go <laughs> um cousin you know helping her move all her stuff into her room at her uncle's house and um her cousin is telling her that she's gonna get rid of the creamy crack and get a weave and she was like what she what? said specifically she's about to go to Virgie's. It was like specifically Linda, exactly. Linda, no, don't do it. But the way the film ends is you hear Anna reading the story of the Moss Hair Girl, and you find out that in this folklore, it the master that she kills with her hair is um is oh what what what's the term who 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 he left behind were two sons who owned the land 
and they take you back to that plantation looking scene where people are essentially harvesting the hair and you see that one of the sons or not even sons one of the generations of the story is james vanderbeek character Woo, jesus full he, circle full circle so basically the story ends saying that his um sons inherited the land and everything that was on the land and so they were they did everything that they will please with it and so they decided to harvest the hair and sell it for black women to put on top of their heads what what were your thoughts at this point ashley Oh my goodness. I could not figure out how to feel. I remember my first time watching, I think I felt confusion. I was like, wait, 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 wait. What's happening? So James Vanderbeek this whole time has been uh, playing this character in terms of being this music executive and all these things just to further this agenda with his family's business. You know, I also was trying to figure out, is it really him who is making decisions or is he also doing the bidding of these witches who are possessing his family's land and then my my third thought again was going back to the idea that this white supremacy and white dominance was definitely a central theme that that justin wanted to be felt throughout the whole course of the movie because the fact that we're going back to the fact that everything that's happening to these characters all of this craziness comes down to these previous white slave owners who are this story is true, as Blair Underwood has alluded to all this time, this is real, yes, yes. Um, have continued to propel and do these things. And then I also wondered, to what extent was it going to continue to permeate society? Like, were was Vanessa Williams' character really dead? Was was Kelly Rowland's character fully possessed yet? Because when we saw her at the salon at the, at the one point in time when um, Anna was getting her hair done, her eyes were completely gone. Mm-hmm. But then when she performs later, her eyes are back. So it's like, is yes. she still battling her hair demons or is mm-hmm. she completely taking over and is going to like, you know, take over the world as a superstar who, you know, basically gets all these black women to convert to this crazy deadly hair. hair. Yeah. Like I had so many, I was left with so many questions. And so that's part of the reason why I didn't really give it a high rating as you know, I probably would have liked to, because I just had so many questions. The first time I saw it and I saw how James Vanderbeek character was a descendant of, you know, essentially the master from this folklore, I just felt like I really wish there was a little bit more meat to this because it just seemed like a really big jump for me. Like, yeah. like, because this plantation is in Louisiana. I don't think we mentioned that previously. Right. And so... I, and so, the whole story is based in LA. And the whole story, exactly, is based in LA. So I just I just felt like I had so many questions on that. I had, so, I had questions on uh, Kelly Rowland's character as well. Like, does she completely turn? Or how, who does she mm-hmm. kill in the meantime while she's having this, you know, music career? Does she kill Usher? I, Please exactly. don't like usher. And um, <laughs> I don't know. It, it was a very interesting film. I, I feel like you definitely, I felt like I mentioned the colorism aspect of things, the um, respectability politics, you know, at that time and even still today, depending on who you talk to, when black people wear their hair in a natural state, in its natural state is considered undone or mm-hmm. um or abrasive it's for mm-hmm. some people like they mm-hmm. just it automatically makes them feel uncomfortable and it's like you know we we obviously still live with um you know the eurocentral standards of beauty like how do you how do you how do you progress in your career and still stay true to yourself at the same damn time that is the mm-hmm. question Absolutely. and um I d- it definitely plays into that because obviously with anna's character she completely loses herself mm-hmm. um and luckily she has enough time to still redeem herself um but again she's starting back at zero 
you know. Right, right, right. Because they don't go on to discuss, you know, what her career path is going to be now, whether she'll continue down the music, uh, you know, television, trying to be a VJ or, you mm -hmm. know, we don't necessarily get that closure. But again, to your point, I think one of the things when you talked about at the beginning, you gave it a D plus because of the, the ending. I do feel like I was left with a lot uh, to wonder about and it, it did not move me in any way that maybe the hope was that it was going to move me like it wasn't like the end mm -hmm. of get out right like the yeah. end of get out was so jarring and mm -hmm. so significant uh in terms of our lived experience now there were a lot of moments during this movie that it, i felt that in my lived experience but not so much that i'm like i'm never gonna put false hair in my hair again you know what i mean like it did not <laughs> necessarily change anything significantly for me with having watched this but do I appreciate again the ability that they had to tell this story and to have those moments of relatability mm -hmm. um absolutely and before we end um all together I would like to mention that I was on Justin's social media recently and he's been really um showcasing um a lot of things in the build up for the premiere of this movie and mm -hmm. one of the things that he shared was essentially the development of it and he has a whole post that talks about um reference and references and homework um when developing you know tropes of the film and i want to bring up some of them so um the first thing on here is the shining um okay. uh, Another one is uh, Rosemary's Baby, mm -hmm. um, The Wig, which I'm not familiar with. I think it's an Asian or Korean film. Um, okay. Another movie called The Seconds, um, another movie called To Sleep With Anger. And the one that I think is the most obvious and most dear, near and dear to my heart was um, Little Shop of Horrors. And okay. I got that clear as day with the essential feed me of the hair mm -hmm. where you cannot control exactly um you can't control the hunger you you're just only you, the only thing you can do is feed it you know right right, and, right right and this is what i also wanted to come back to you were talking about how convenient it was to throw the landlord out the window mm -hmm. little shop of horrors was very convenient when they disposed of the bodies that was mm -hmm. um that was something that was prop um prominent in that film so so that was a shout out to that movie got mm -hmm. it got it well that's great to know that um you know he cited what his references were we you don't get that often so i appreciate no. it yeah anybody who like that's another thing that i think i like about um quentin tarantino is people who are fans of cinema mm -hmm. um i think i almost gravitate to uh, not more, but I like a lot because it's like the idea of not only have you created content or a lane for yourself or what have you, you're, you're a fan and we're fans. So mm -hmm. absolutely love, love to know what you get into. The Justin. last little, little uh, shop of horror reference that's obvious is when uh, she cuts her finger and the hair gets a little bit of the blood that happens in the movie. Mm. Um, I'm a huge fan of Little Shop of Horror, so that's got it. Got it. More. Anyway, you're funny. Um, the last thing I was gonna say because we <laughs> talked about talking about what our hairstyles are currently as a part of this. So I mentioned already that I have braids. Yes. And I have very very long past waist length. Yes. Uh, box braids at the moment because I love braids and I live now in a very warm, humid climate. Mm -hmm. So it is definitely a hairstyle, one of my go-to styles. I've been on a real hair journey, which again is why this movie has been palpable for me. I got off the creamy crack about uh, five years ago now at this point. Yes. I'm completely natural. Um, so, you know, again, I'm still trying to figure out my natural hair, but um, again, I mean, it's just been a journey and any black woman who goes down any type of journey with their hair can totally relate to this film and find their points of reference as well as, you know, again, the career aspects of things. So, so I just want to talk about that and then what your, how your hairstyle is and your journey with that as well. Yes. Yeah, so I currently have what they call a TWA. I have a teeny weeny afro. Um, <laughs> I, I've been natural since 2013. Um, I transitioned, so there was no big top for me. So I've been natural. I didn't do one either. I didn't do yeah. one. Yeah. I, um, 
so I've been natural for seven years, but I will say this year for my birthday, I decided to chop off all my hair because why not? <laughs> she looked, she looked, she looks amazing. I just, I'm so, I was you. like, God, I wish I was one of those people who could have short hair. I don't think I have the face for it, but you look amazing. Oh, God bless you. And thank you. Thank you. And what I will say is I'm a woman that believes every woman should do it at least once in her life. I think mm -hmm. it's a, it's, I think it's a form of freedom. I think it's a form of like F you to society in a way too, because it's like, you know, I feel like we, a lot of our society ha likes to hide behind hair. And so when you don't have that to hide behind, I feel like you really step into yourself. Mm, and so that's one a of really the, good point. One of the things that I realize, um, and I love my hairdresser so much. Love you, Brittany. Um, she asked me so many times before she decided to go for it. She was like, are you sure? Are you sure? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm so ready. And honestly, COVID help, helped it if I'm, if I'm being completely transparent, because mm -hmm. I'm just like, you know what, why not? I mean, according to Fauci, 2022 is when things may get back to normal. So <laughs> I got the time. I got the time. I ain't going Love nowhere. It. To but, your point too, I remember that was one of the reasons why, because I used to have really, really, really long hair. And I remember somebody once telling me, you know, that basically is who you are. And that mm. is what makes you beautiful. And I was like, mm. fuck all of that. I'm going to show y'all. Yeah. That's yeah. when I started manipulating my hair. That's when I started cutting it, yeah. coloring it, doing all that stuff. So the idea, again, of rebellion, which we talked about a little bit at the beginning, yes. not only sometimes do we rebel against society, we rebel against people in our personal lives who think they can tell us exactly. how we should or should not wear our hair. Period. I'm not here for any of it. And I, I think our upbringing has a lot to do with it too. Obviously us being black women, but we've had this conversation in private. My mom has always had short hair. So I mm -hmm. have never associated someone's complete and utter ultimate signs of beauty to their hair. And I feel mm -hmm. like part of that has been a blessing for me because for me, you know, there's, there's beauty in all things, everything, both physical and inside, right? Internal. Mm -hmm. But I never had that. I never had that stick. So for me, it was never anything that um, I put so much stock Emphasis in. Into, right, yeah. Right. So, so I think that's part of the reason. And my mom and my sister have both shaved off their hair um, at different points in times in their lives. And I, I find it extremely liberating. Again, the story I was getting to with my hairdresser, she asked me so many times and I was like, yeah, I'm ready, I'm ready. So when she pulled my hair, mind you, I had, I had amazingly, I had amazing um, natural hair uh, in terms of like after the birth of my daughter, it was nice and long and everything. But she took my hair and she took the scissors and she went snap, like right ne next to my head. And I was like, oh here we go here it was we go. very real it was very real but it was exhilarating and honestly when she was done I laughed I laughed it was like it was a for not saying that we're old by any means but I appreciate first and mm -hmm. it was a first for me to be able to experience it and I giggled I was giggling I was like wow and when I looked at myself in the mirror I was like I look like me yeah I look like me and I look great. Like, I can imagine it being so cathartic. You know, they say a lot of women make major hair changes during significant life events. And 2020 has been a hell of a significant life girl. event. Girl. So, girl. I know, you know, a lot of celebrities have fallen suit this year. And um, uh, yeah, I, I think, again, I think you look fabulous. Thank I think you. you look fabulous with every hairstyle you have chosen to wear. <laughs> Same and again, to you, Ashley. I, I absolutely you love so your much. braids. Love Thank them. you. I hope if there's no other messaging that women get from this, it's, it's listen. Do you, boo. Do Period. your thing. But Period, you know, boo. You are. There's going to be so many times that that part of you is going to be questioned, challenged, whatever. Do what is true to who you are. And people, uh, people are attracted to confident people. If you carry yourself with confidence mm -hmm. and if, the, if they don't appreciate you, you don't need to be there. Okay. Exactly. So... Exactly. Well, let's sort of roll into these hidden gems, Gloria, because as yes. usual, girl, we could keep going and going and we don't want to stay too long this week. So Absolutely. hit us with your hit us with your hidden gems. 
Yes. Yeah, so I have three hidden gems this week. I have um, a CBS show called Evil, which is now available on Netflix. That's how I become or became aware of it. It follows a um aspiring priest a psychologist and an associate and they essentially look into uh spiritual cases and and their job is to determine whether it's it's spiritual or if it's just simply mental health and so Mm. because that line is so blurred throughout the show it's very intense Mm. (laughs) and it's very uh spooky at times and um my husband and i finished it uh it's 13 episodes 45 minutes each definitely worth a watch um my next uh hidden gem would be the remake of the witches which is on hbo max Mm -hmm. it's starring anne hathaway and um octavia spencer I honestly did not really enjoy this movie for its ending, but I think it's worth a watch because I'm obsessed with the original. Um, it also starring Angelica Houston. Yes, starring Angelica Houston, the goat. I mean, this show. Oh, love that movie. Grew up with it. It's like cult classic. Okay, but um, in this remake, it, it shows. Um, it, it centers a black family in the 1950s, 60s. And I think that's pretty cool and I appreciate it. So that's why I think it's worth a watch. Um, and my final hidden gem, as you, and because this is our Halloween episode, that's why they're all spooky shows and films, um, would be Netflix originals, Vampires versus the Bronx. Mm-hmm. Um, again, it's nothing really new, but it's a fun watch, and um, the kids are adorable. And again, cast of uh, brown, beautiful brown and black people, definitely worth the watch. What are your hidden gems this week, Ashley? Nice. I was just gonna add, Evil. The star of that is—is is it the guy who played Luke Cage? Is he the star? He is the star. Okay. I'm so happy he got another check coming because Netflix yeah. canceled it. But yes, right. definitely a great show on CBS. But again, first season available on Netflix, and I'm sure also uh, CBS All Access. Yeah. Okay. So my hidden gems, again, I'm starting off with a CBS show as well. CBS has been doing a great job of kind of getting their content out to a wider audience on Netflix. It's The Unicorn, which is a sitcom comedy based uh, starring Walton Walton Goggins, who I really enjoy usually as a very much of a character actor. He was in mm-hmm. Vice Principals on mm-hmm. uh, on HBO that I love. He also made an appearance in Righteous Gemstones. So him and Danny McBride seem to have a really good relationship. Um, but he's usually just this hilarious kind of character actor. This he's kind of playing a more straight laced dad who was recently widowed, taking care of his two younger daughters. You see a great dynamic with, with him and his kids, as well as him and two sets of friends that he has. And uh, just a very light, very fun. I love to see kind of his 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 life as he's trying to kind of move forward, get back into the dating game, all of that. Very enjoyable for me. Um, it is on Netflix, as I mentioned, first season, 18 episodes. Season two is about to premiere on CBS on November 12th. So feel free to check that out and feel free to check out the first season on Netflix. My second hidden gem and final hidden gem is one that I just, if you're a lover of HGTV, I think you'll get into this one. It's a it's a series called Stay Here, and I binged it so quick. I literally was like, oh, this is my last episode that I'm going to watch, and then I was done with the whole series. It's a vacation rental TV show, which I really enjoy, because even HGTV, I haven't watched any that focus on vacation rentals. So it's still kind of the, the dynamic of a man and a woman or a pairing of a man and a woman. Um, some, of, some of the HGTV shows, though, are, you know, two men, two women, whatever. But um, the guy is a realtor. The woman is interior designer they have a great rapport uh they have great energy you get to see them kind of travel around the united states helping different 
property owners kind of update their rentals, as well as really embracing the culture and the um, area that they're in to help people who come to the rentals get to know the area. So in terms of just those types of shows, I love that it takes you around the cities, even if you are just watching to better understand some of these cities, because like I've never been in Seattle. So they show you certain parts of Seattle that like the homeowners recommend their renters going to. I just thought that was pretty dope. It made it a little bit more enjoyable even just watching. So again, that show is called Stay Here. I think it was either six or eight episodes. Again, I watched them so quick, I don't remember. But I loved it. If you want a little HGTV related show, feel free to check that out. And that is my final hidden gem for the week, girl. Ashley, we did it. Girl, we did it again. Again, I know we were supposed to keep this a little shorter. I don't think we necessarily fully achieved it, but we're we're a work in progress on it. And uh, we hope you guys yet again have enjoyed sticking with us, hearing our discussions on our different hot topics on bad hair. You know, drop a drop a note, drop a comment. You can find us yet again on social media. We're on Instagram at Recap and Podcast. We're on Twitter. We have a Gmail. Account count and Delora you recently mentioned feel free to give us a rating please we need some yes. ratings rate us on Apple Podcasts in particular if you can and please like subscribe and follow us do all the things we love we've gotten like I said at the beginning some great feedback we appreciate each and every one of you every week Absolutely. for taking the time to spend time with us we know there's so many other things you could be doing and we appreciate it because Delora you my girl and I love having these moments where we get to chat Ashley exactly you are my girl and this has been so amazing I look forward to it every week absolutely well guys that's it for this week. We will see you next time. Be blessed. And we're going to see how we're feeling next week after the election. Lord Jesus. God help us all. Have a great one. Bye.